try to make some very strange sound. Listen carefully. Isn't that loud? This is because when I blow really, really hard, I cause the cans to vibrate real fast and it produces a very strange sound, just like an elephant sound. Alright. For the next experiment, we are going to produce sound using a straw. We cut the straw into shorter length and then blow. That sounds like something screaming, like farting, isn't it? Alright, so for the next one, we will try to balance the ping pong ball using straw. The ping pong ball flirt in mid air because of Bernoulli principle. Alright, let's move on to the next experiment. For this experiment, we are going to use some balloons. There is one nail here, and what happens if I pop the balloon? Uh, it pops! What about I have many nails like this? Will it pop? Let's try. It didn't pop because of these nails. Alright. So for our next experiment, we are going to use a blue balloon and a bamboo stick. Now, I am going to carefully push this inside one end. It went in! And then see if I can carefully make it out on the other end. There you go! This is because the ends of the balloons are actually thicker than the side of the balloon so that it didn't make the balloon burst. Okay, for the next experiment, The candle extinguished because carbon dioxide does not support combustion. And you see, I have one more candle left here, in which I will bring out my yellow color balloon. Inside this yellow color balloon, there is some water. Okay, I will try to burn this balloon. The balloon didn't break because the water absorbed the heat from the balloon and caused the balloon uh, and did not burn the balloon. What if I have a balloon with air but no water inside? Will it pop? It pops the balloon. Let's go to the kitchen. Inside this can, there are a few drops of water and I will heat this up until the water boils. As I heat the water, it will boil and then it will cause the air pressure inside to become very, very high. But this is a bowl of ice water and when I put the can inside the ice water, it will cause the air pressure to drop very fast and we will see what will happen to the bottle. Like this. Oh, did you see that? The bottle actually crushed because of the atmospheric pressure that is very high. It will cause the bottle to crush into like this. All right, let's move to the next experiment, which I have a plastic bottle here with a little bit of water. I will shake it a bit and then I will do this. I will compress it really, really hard like this. As I compress it, I can feel it actually heat up a little bit in my palm. Okay, now. Carefully, I will open this bottle here and then we will see what happens. Did you see the white color mist coming out? It's actually condensation of water vapor. Alright, for our next experiment, we have two eggs here and I will make the eggs drop into the jar using the principle of inertia. In three, two, one! The egg actually dropped inside! The other egg didn't drop, but it's okay. You can try this at home. Alright, now I think I'm very tired. Let me just take a cup of Oh, sorry, I forgot we are still doing the experiment, right? Okay, now I have one cut over here and I will do this. Ta-da! It didn't fall because the air pressure outside is actually greater than the pressure inside so the, the, it can hold up the water inside. Alright, I believe that's all the experiments, is it? Um, no? We have one more at the balcony, let's go! I have a tea bag lined up here inside the bowl, and if you open up the tea bag, you will get something like this. 
Okay, carefully put this inside a cup and then we will light it on fire. As it starts to heat up, it actually makes the air surrounding become hot. When the air becomes hot, we know that hot air actually rises up in the air. So it is going to flirt up on top. Alright, so never mind, you can try this at home and it definitely can fly up very, very high. Okay, so I think that's all the experiment. Let's stop the timer. Oh, I finished it. I finished it off at 6 minutes 21 seconds. I believe you can beat my result at home. Alright, see you next time. possible to contain because of technology, because of online, you can reach so many people. But yet, uh, nonetheless, I would like to thank everyone here present in Technopine for coming here to support such a great cause. Okay, without further ado, it's a great honor I'd like to invite Mr. Bang Lai Ying, Lord Director of Penang Tech Center, for us to officially kick off this 2021 to the opening stage. Uh, 
Bank Women's Development Corporation. To all our directors, to all our sponsors, to all our partners working with us from the schools, uh, on behalf of Tycho, I'd like to wish all of you a big welcome. This is the fifth year that uh, we have been partnering with the with the Penang Women Development Corporation in hosting women in science. And this, like what the team was saying, this is the second year that we're doing it virtually. And it's a little bit unfortunate because on a virtual basis, uh, we miss out a lot of things. But nevertheless, the show has to go on. So without uh, you know, going to all the other details again uh, on behalf of Thank you. Thank you very much for your help and support, and thank you again for coming on to today's function. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Ah. Next, I'd like to invite one of the masterminds of, of uh, Women in Science, CEO of PWTC, Ms. Hong Gile, who said a few words. Mr. Ang Lai Jin, uh, the board member of the title, and the other board members, uh, as well as our sponsors, partners, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls out there. Yeah. A very good morning to everyone. And thank you for participating and also uh, supporting this very important initiative. Uh, which we started, as Mr. Uh, Ang has said, five years ago. Um, a partnership uh, you know, with Tecton and also PWC. And we have been able to do it not just because of the two of us, but because of you, the partners and also our sponsors who have made it possible. Um, the whole idea of having this uh, woman in science was because we, we wanted to uh, inspire more girls and boys to love science, stay in science. Because we know that uh, Penang used to be known as the Silicon Valley of the East. You know, if there's no action taken, we will lose that glamour. And it is so important for Penang, especially because with so many MNCs here, we really needed the talent pool of um, boys and girls to stay in science and continue and pursue their career in science. If you look around, actually, science is among us. I will have, have one that we have taken it for granted, boys and girls here. Yeah? We have taken it for granted. Actually, it wouldn't have happened if we lost science. Yeah. So, things that actually, even around us, and we even have now, we have a self defense uh, uh, activity, even for this. Some people ask me, why are we having a self defense during this? Because the whole idea is that we wanted to let our boys and girls know. Science is, is actually truly part of nature. Yeah. How do you then use science to protect yourself? Which are the areas, which are the points which are more sensitive? And we should use that you know, to, to defend ourselves. And secondly, it's actually a way to empower our boys and girls. To be able to take action if something will happen. Yeah. So um, with that, I am very, really uh, happy and we put gratitude for all of the partners and also our sponsors. And of course, back door. Yeah. Without, I was telling you that um, we are partners in crime. Yeah. <laughs> so without, without all the support and of course without the state government coming in, this would have been possible. Yeah. And in conjunction with, uh, with we normally have women in science uh, during our international university. So we I dare to take minutes of your time okay, to share a video that I have. Okay. Because this year's uh, theme for International Women's Day is choose to challenge. Okay. So I just wanted to share something that I personally choose to challenge and hopefully inspire our boys and girls to challenge themselves. Right. 
So with that, thank you very much, everyone. And have fun. Remember. Challenge uh, when I was actually in the uni days, when I was in uh, undergrad. So, undergrads, uh, we remember the reserve army was only for a lot of number boys. So, we were the first batch of women because I chose the challenge. Okay? And we were the first batch of women, girls at the time. So now we're gonna, okay? Who challenged and said, that, Why is it not open? Girls. Okay, and we are very proud to say um, that until now we still have girls taking up the training. This is for reserve army. It's like the second line of defense in uh, Malaysia. So uh, what I'm here saying, what I'm saying is that I hope that each of us choose to challenge some of the norms, some of the stereotypes that's happening around us. Okay? Because if we don't choose to challenge, nothing change. When we choose to challenge, things change and hopefully things change for the better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Ong, for the inspiring story. Uh, I'm sure if I face with a similar situation, I will probably run the other way. <laughs> okay, next, uh, uh, please join me in welcoming YB uh, Fair Lighting, Arjun Chongda, for his speech. YB. A very good morning to all of you, uh, Mr. Ang Tai Yu, uh, interim CEO of Penang Techno, Madam Ong Bi Ling, CEO of Penang Women's Development Corporation, uh, fellow board of, board, of, uh, board of Director of Techno, ladies and gentlemen. First, I'd like to say it is an honor to be in, involved in Open to Design, and I'd like to thank all the parties involved in organizing this event. I believe that science and technology should be taught to children from a young age so that they have a head start in a world that is quickly progressing in terms of science and technology. As many of you are aware, the theme of this year's International Women's Day is Women in Leadership. Achieving an equal future in the COVID-19 world. As countries and communities start to recover from a devastating pandemic, it is the right time to push for equal opportunity to rebuild our community and society. Experts, regardless of gender, must be given equal opportunity in playing their part to make pivotal decisions as countries respond to an 
and recover from COVID-19 pandemic. Why is that? We will affect the well-being of people and the planet for generations to come. Despite the many barriers such as old traditional norms that require women to support the family or social economy barrier of current working environment, women, especially young women, are at the forefront of diverse and inclusive movements of social change. That includes that includes their leading role in, in taking a stand against climate change, fighting for a great economy, and pushing for women's rights. Today, we have an amazing speakers lined up of big experts and leaders of their respective scientific fields. Of, and I hope all the students, not students, later the students. I hope all the students here can learn something today and be inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Wadi Teh, for our next uh, item of the program. Uh, actually, Ms. Wong has already alluded to it. Uh, so, I want to thank her for introducing our next uh, segment, which is our self defense workshop. So, Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Sharon John from Elite Taekwondo Academy. So today, thanks for PWDC for inviting us for sharing some strong self-defense. Okay, let's start today with a human big point. First of all, a big point is coming to Our human body weight point. First is eye, nose, ear, throat, armpit, solar vessels, ribs, groin, shin, and throat. So, first the weight point is going to attack for the eye, going to walk. Nose, hand, throat, leg, or the cross, a bit to the same, the cross, or hand, rib, hand, ear, hand, voice, and right now, back, or the shin, head, 
is a full pick altogether. And then the close is a Okay, this is basic human body requirement. Now, I want to explain our human body reference. We are required that our human body reference. So, first reference is our our leg. Next is our face, two face. Next is our elbow, two elbow. One, two, three, four, five. Next is our knee. Six, seven. The last two is our foot. Or we call it feet. Okay, how to attack with that? First is head. When you attack head, it's like this. Um, like this. Okay, face. Face, you have to hold the face attack from this, the time, or like this, the shape, or like this. How to hold the face? First, you have to grab your finger down, down, and your thumb always put here. Your thumb always put here. Remember, don't put inside. Why? Because when you find your thumb is putting inside, say your thumb is putting inside, you find like this, you will get hurt or get injured of your thumb. So always put here. Your thumb is here, then you find. Then the, your face. This is two points, two weapons. It's a hard, hard points in at the face. So you'll find like this. There. Okay. Next is the elbow. Okay, I'm using your elbow to attack here, 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 or here. Same both hands. Here. Okay, next is our knee. How are you going to use our knee? Right, you have this, and this. Okay, last, we call it feet, foot. Make do a front kick, attack, and all the side kick. This before the feet. Okay. Okay, now you get it? Recoil and our human body weapon. Okay, now next, let us show you some the basic, the basic self defense. We start from our tiger claw, we call it the tiger claw. How to grab? How to grab the hand, how to lose it? What the hell? Okay, you will grab it in your hand. The hand I did. Just turn your hand to the narrow, the bone to the narrow, and you yeah. Remember the throat is open and close, and the weak point is from here, come up from here. You don't come up from down, it's kind of open. So turn your hand, pull it up. Okay, pull it up. Now, there is more strength in the right side, so you have to use your body weight. Three, breath. Turn. Okay, grab. Let it turn. Okay, now you grab it hard, very hard. Okay, one, two, three, turn to your body weight. Together with your body weight, swing with your shoulder, swing it up. Okay, grab. One, two, three, turn. Okay, next. The left hand, the right hand, grab the left hand. This hand, grab with this hand. So, how are you going to do it? Right? Yeah. If you throw like this way, this cannot say. Get it from here. Okay, first you have to grab the hand, it first. And it press up. Okay. Okay, move it fast, grab. Okay, good. Now, both hands can be one hand. Okay, this is very, very simple way. When somebody catch you like this, you just tell yourself you want to take back your hand. Then you put up and turn the body. Remember, always you feel that the open.
give uh, the up and OID. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, OID and staff back on stage to present uh, a good conversation to our sponsors. So, in more particular, uh, in alphabetical order, I would like to invite a uh, representative from airport, Mr. Elvin Kamichiyo. Okay, next. Is somebody attending from here? 
Okay, let me explain. When you're walking alone in the streets, no matter in the evening or day or night, nowadays everyone likes to use the phone and keep pressing your phone. Your eyes keep looking here, it's very dangerous. Please don't do that. You can hold your phone. Just walk. And your eyes take measure of observe everything is safe. You don't keep pressing, don't don't go down your head and keep pressing. It's very dangerous. Okay, now if anything happens to you, you can hold your phone, your phone as your record. Safe. And if someone behind you or someone wants to disturb you, and stop it using your phone, like that. This is your weapon. Your phone is harder than your case. When you go to that, that, um, um, um. And then you come behind you, go to pump, that is. Okay, so your pressure must be fast. Or you're holding your key. Holding your key. You want to go back. And when you take the lid up to your window, ready your key. So how are you going to grab your key? Hold it. Okay, hold it like this. Okay, hold it like this. this. Okay, so, and somebody near you, trying to attack you, this is your weapon. This is your weapon. Hold it tight and hold it. Okay, he can be injured or he can be tight, but don't. Okay, try this. Oh, no. You can grab your finger, you can grab your key, and this. This is your weapon. Protect yourself. Okay, this is very dangerous. You can face. Okay, okay, next. Okay, before we ending, I show something that if somebody really behind you, what you should do. So you just walk and somebody can find you. You don't walk away. You don't go and cannot see. Okay? You don't walk away. Okay? So, if they can continue on the pressure, what you should do with this now, they can turn the turn like this and move on and say. If they continue, you can give him a five ringgit. No, first, first. Okay. First, then, and run. Okay. Hold fast and run. No. Left, turn, left, and run. Good turn there. <laughs> you just give him a five ringgit, then you run away. Remember, don't challenge. Okay. Today is, I think, is uh, time for us. Thank, thank you for, uh, thank you for PWTC for inviting us for sharing some of the basic self defense se session. So, thank you for watching. Please stay safe and stay healthy. And, uh, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Hi everybody, welcome to the very first episode of Science at Home. Are you bored today? Are you stuck at home just like me? No worries, we have lined up 15 science experiments for you to do in 5 minutes. That is about 20 seconds for each experiment. All these experiments you can do using the materials at your house, okay? So without further ado, I will start in 3, 2, 1, let's go! For the first experiment, we are going to use some milk and a few drops of food coloring. Carefully put a little bit of dishwashing soap in the middle and watch what happens. Whoa, isn't that cute? Isn't that cool? What is going on here? So the dishwashing soap actually reduces the surface tension of the milk and cause the milk to spread out like this. Alright, for our next experiment, we are going to balance two fork and a toothpick like this on the edge of the cup. 
just like this. You have to do it really slowly and carefully. Ta-da! This is how you can balance three, these three things on top of the cup. All right. For our next experiment, we are going to use these two soda cans, which I believe you can find this at home. All right. So now I will try to make some very strange sound. Listen carefully. <gasps> Because when I blow really, really hard, I cause the cans to vibrate real fast and it produces a very strange sound, just like an elephant sound. Alright, for the next experiment, we are going to produce sound using a straw. We cut the straw into shorter lengths and then blow. That sound like something screaming, like farting, isn't it? Alright, so for the next one, we will try to balance the ping pong ball using straw. The people will flirt in mid air because of Bernoulli principle. Alright, let's move on to the next experiment. For this experiment, we are going to use some balloons. There is one nail here and what happens if I pop the balloon? And it pops! What about I have many nails like this? Will it pop? Let's try. It didn't pop! Because all the pressure is actually evenly distributed between all these nails. Alright, so for our next experiment, we are going to use a blue balloon and a bamboo stick. Now, I am going to carefully push this inside one end. It went in! And then see if I can carefully make it out on the other end. There you go! This is because the ends of the balloons are actually thicker than the side of the balloon so that it didn't make the balloon burst. Okay, for the next experiment, I have a green color balloon and a bottle with some vinegar here. Inside the balloon, I have some baking soda. The balloon expands real fast and it becomes very big. This is the evidence that actually there is some gas produced inside this bottle. So what gas is it? It's actually carbon dioxide. I will remove this balloon and we will take a look at the carbon dioxide gas. I have some candles here and I will carefully pour the gas on top of the candle. The candle extinguished because carbon dioxide does not support combustion. And you see, I have one more candle left here in which I will bring out my yellow color balloon. Inside this yellow color balloon, there is some water. Okay, I will try to burn this balloon. The balloon didn't break because the water absorbed the heat from the balloon and caused the balloon uh, and did not burn the balloon. What if I have a balloon with air but no water inside? Will it pop? It pops the balloon. Let's go to the kitchen. Inside this can, there are a few drops of water and I will heat this up until the water boils. As I heat the water, it will boil and then it will cause the air pressure inside to become very, very high. But this is a bowl of ice water and when I put the can inside the ice water, it will cause the air pressure to drop very fast and we will see what will happen to the bottle. Like this. Oh, did you see that? The bottle actually crushed. Because of the atmospheric pressure that is very high, it will cause the bottle to crush into like this. All right. Let's move to the next experiment, which I have a plastic bottle here with a little bit of water. I will shake it a bit and then I will do it. I will compress it really, really hard, like this. As I compress it, I can feel it actually heats up a little bit in my palm. Okay? Now, carefully, I will open this bottle here and then we will see what happens. Did you see the white color mist coming up? It's actually condensation of water vapor. Alright, for our next experiment, we have two eggs here and I'll make the eggs drop into the jar using the principle of inertia. In three, two, one! The egg actually drops inside! The other egg doesn't drop, but it's okay, you can try this at home. Alright, now I think I'm very tired. Let me just take a cup of water. Oh, sorry, I forgot we are still doing the experiment, right? Okay, now I have one cut over here and I will do this. Ta-da! It didn't fall because the air pressure outside is actually greater than the pressure inside so the, the, it can hold up the water inside. Alright, I believe that's all the experiments, is it? Um, no? 
We have one more at the balcony. Let's go. I have a tea bag lined up here inside the bowl. And if you open up the tea bag, you will get something like this. Okay, carefully put this inside a cup and then we will light it on fire. As it starts to heat up, it actually makes the air surrounding become hot. When the air become hot, we know that hot air actually rises up in the air. So it is going to flirt up on top. Alright, so never mind, you can try this at home and it definitely can fly up very, very high. Okay, so I think that's all the experiment. Let's stop the timer. Oh, I finished it. I finished it off at 6 minutes 21 seconds. I believe you can beat my result at home. Alright, see you next time. Hey guys, thank you for watching our video. If you enjoy our content, please like it and share it to your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon so that you will receive a notification when we release the next video. Please also follow all our social medias. Thank you. See you next time. Three, two, one, action. Hi everybody, are you being stuck at home and feeling bored? No worries, today we are going to do some experiments. Oh, I don't know, I'm so awkward. Today we are going to... Hi everybody, welcome to the first episode of Science at Home. Today we are going to do 15 science experiments in 5 minutes. That is going to be... <laughs> ah! Dig some dishwashing liquid and put it in the middle. <laughs> Let me get my cut here. Now I will do this. The water actually stays in the cup. <laughs> Three, two, one. Now into the cup. In three, two, one. Yay! Now in three, two, one. Oops, sorry. Let's do it again. Okay. Really, really hard. Okay, you can try it out. distancing scientists from Adobe So do you still remember this glass table when we did our very first video and the 15 size experiments on this table okay some of the experiments are on this table okay so today we are back at the first location here and we are going to play some games some games to test our knowledge on COVID-19 COVID correct what game is that it's called the five seconds rule are you ready for this yeah let's, let's go. go so Fatin what are the rules here are a few questions that we will ask each other. Mm, and you have to answer the questions in 5, five seconds. seconds. But we also challenge you to play the game with us to test your knowledge about COVID-19. Mm. Alright, so Fatin, I'm ready. Ask me the first question. Okay, ready, Shin? Mm. Uh, the first question is, 3 symptoms of COVID-19 in 5 seconds, go! Number 1, sore throat. Number 2, fever. Number 3, flu-like symptoms. Good. Uh, okay, so besides all those typical symptoms, other symptoms might also involve, uh, for example, loss of sense of taste or loss of sense of smell, wow. right? Okay, so uh, for your information, all these symptoms uh, might take up to 14 days to okay. develop. 14 days. That means when the person is already infected by the virus, it could not feel anything, okay? The person might not feel anything. Okay, for the first few days, they might just be like normal person. Mm -hmm. and, but at this time, uh, they can actually be infectious already. That means they can tra uh, transmit the virus to other people. Mm -hmm. We call these people uh, asymptomatic uh, patients. patients. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. So if you're exposed to this virus or you suspect yourself uh, were in close contact with a positive person, what you do is you need to do self-quarantine at home for 14 days okay, to make sure that you are not uh, getting the virus. Alright, Fatih, my question for you. 
give me the three C guidelines like MOH. Go. Uh, uh, avoid crowded spaces, uh, avoid confined space, and avoid close conversations. Right. Uh, so the first one is crowded spaces. So you have to avoid a place with a lot of people because we might get infection from any of the people inside that we don't know. And then the second one is confined space. Confined space like the leaf, uh, it is a small place so you might get infection from the one that is close to you. High chance. Yeah, high chance of getting infection. Mm. Okay, the next one close. is close conversation. You must uh, make sure you have one meter distance to another person that you are talking to. Then only it is safer for you to talk. Correct. Uh, okay. The next one. Yeah. The next question yeah, for you is it? Yes. Yeah. So, ready, Shin? Mm. Uh, three myths about COVID nineteen. Myths. Okay, myth number one: high temperature can kill the virus. Uh, drinking bleach can kill the virus. And finally, wearing a mask costs you uh reduce oxygen take. Okay la. <laughs> Okay, number one: uh, high temperature. Okay, a uh, high temperature can uh, actually kill COVID nineteen virus, oh. kill the SARS and COV virus, COV two. However, okay, you need. Uh, it depends on the surface. Also, it depends on the surface and depends on the exposure type. Oh. So, for example, like uh, fifty to fifty-five degrees Celsius heat. Uh, okay, how long do you think it, it will take to kill off the virus? A few seconds. No. Okay, so for fifty to fifty-five degrees Celsius, it will take around twenty minutes. Okay, twenty oh, minutes to long. <laughs> effectively kill the virus. Mm. Okay, at higher temperature, for example, like seventy degrees Celsius, it. It will also need uh, up to three minutes. Okay, three minutes to kill the virus effectively. Okay, so what? Very, very, very hot, very hot. So please do not go under the sun when you suspect that you have the virus. Okay, sunbathe there or like because the virus might be inside your body already. Okay, so if you are go under the sun, it will only affect your skin. Okay, it, it will not kill any virus inside you, and you might also need to stand under the sun for a very long time for that to be effective. Very hot. Number two, bleach. Okay, bleach is a chemical that is effective to kill off the virus. However, it is toxic as well. That means if you drink bleach, bleach, you will also die. And uh, people usually use bleach to clean surfaces only. Okay, clean surfaces, not to do anything with your body. And finally, wearing a mask. Okay, wearing a mask will not reduce oxygen intake. Okay, it might cause some difficulties in breathing, but oxygen intake is still the same because the oxygen in our atmosphere is still the same, twenty one percent. There are doctors who wear layers of face masks in the hospital, but they are okay. They do not die because they do not they do not suffocate because it will not cause death. Okay, so don't worry and don't make it an excuse to not wearing the mask. Correct. Yeah. So the next question. Okay, Fatih, give me the three correct ways to measure temperature. Go! Uh, measure your forehead, uh, ear, and also your tongue. Correct! Yeah, so why? Because um, different parts of our body have different temperatures. For example, the head, ear, and also tongue, it is at the core part of our body. So the temperature is higher and the temperature is constant. Other parts like the skin or the hands, uh, the temperature is lower and it is not constant. So it is not accurate. Uh, you have to measure at the correct part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the core is where all our vital organs are yeah. for the brain, the mm. heart, the lungs. Mm. Okay. Yes. But what happens when you get a fever? When you get a fever, uh, our body will be increased in temperature. Mm. It is in order to kill the virus and also uh, the bacteria inside our body. So that's why the temperature is increased. If so we get to, fever. Yes, effective to uh, boost our immune system. Yeah. Alright, so just let the body to do its work. Don't go under the sun, okay? Yeah. Now, I have a different thermometer here. So, the infrared thermometer can measure temperature of one person. So, what it actually does is it will pick up infrared radiation from a person. So, by the way, so I point at the fatty head. So, it will actually pick up infrared radiation, which is also known as heat, but it will not emit any radiation. Ah, so the information it will pick up and then it will send to the screen here as a number. So you read this as temperature. Yes. Mm -hmm. However it does not give out any radiation. So it is perfectly safe and perfectly effective to use to measure temperature. No Alright. Cancer. And it won't cancer. cause cancer. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you do it at the correct place like at the forehead, not your hand. Mm -hmm. Now how is this effective compared to other ways of measuring temperature, for example under your tongue? Yeah. Uh, if under your tongue or your ear, this temperature will need to touch your yeah, your places, touch. so it might transmit the virus. Not hygienic. So if, yeah. Mm. If you use your forehead, it will just measure around your forehead. Yeah. It's not touching you your forehead. To touch your forehead. So it's safer. Yes. Uh, 
So yeah, measure, yeah. measure temperature correct way. All right. So the next one, Kati. The next one is uh, three precautions when wearing mask. Five seconds go. Number one, uh, discard your mask properly. Keep your mask properly, and finally, 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 cover, cover, cover your nose and mouth. Yeah. Right, and cover your nose and mouth. Okay. So uh, when you are wearing a mask, make sure you cover your whole no uh, your whole nose and also wow. whole mouth. Yeah. Okay. Don't don't like expose your nose like so like this one. Ah, okay, so very completely, don't do this or don't do this. <laughs> and number two, throw it correctly. So when you uh, remove your mask from your face, okay, do it from the here, back here, okay? Just take it off, take it off like this and fold it properly and throw it inside a bin, a closed bin with a lid, okay, with a cover one. Right? And finally, when you are eating, okay, when you are eating, keep your mask properly. Don't put it on a table only. Just keep it inside a bag like this, ah, like a gift yes, bag, like bag okay? Or, or for example, special bag, special bag for the face mask, or like this one where you can uh put it inside and fold the face mask and store it on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of products in the market lately lah to help you to prevent the virus from the table go inside your mouth and then go inside your body so very important wear your mask properly all right next yeah. so fatin uh, my next question for you is give me the three w guidelines by moh go uh wash your hands uh wear mask and then one each other correct so the first one is wash your hands you have to wash your hand using soap and water and wash thoroughly mm. uh, and then you have to wash for uh, 20 seconds like that it's the same like you're singing happy birthday to you or twinkle twinkle little star in two times yeah then the next one is wear your mask so as she said wear your mask properly cover your nose and mouth uh, always wear your mask when you are going out of your house uh, the next one is one the one is when you see someone not wearing mask or uh not keeping their social distancing you have to warn them yeah that's our responsibility all right okay so the next one i believe is you okay you no we are done oh, we are done already yeah. so uh did you finish the game like just uh like we did just now so i hope that you got all of the answers correctly also la. but yeah. now i want to ask Fatin one final question not done yet la. okay so one final question for one is question. okay if you happen to be stuck at home or under self-isolation what you can do go uh, watch science at home like and share this video and subscribe to this channel yes very true all right so i hope you enjoyed this video and also uh stay at home if not necessary don't go out and so stick to your time. Okay, so we'll see you again next time. Bye bye! Hope you have been enjoying our program so far okay so uh, for those who have just joined us you are joining us live for tech Dome penang's fifth consecutive women in science which is happening in your conjunction with mosti's Mingu science negara welcome today we have four distinguished women who excel in their respective medical scientific research fields to inspire you to pursue a future in science first up we have Professor Dr. Moi Ming Ling, the Deputy Director at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Nagasaki University. 
She's a virologist who has been working on prevention measures against tropical and emerging virus diseases, including the SARS-CoV-2. At the end of last year, Professor Moy was the first foreign researcher to be granted the Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development Award for her contributions in the regional control of infectious diseases. Without further ado, please join me to welcome Prof Moy to Women in Science 2021. Um, hi, Sean. Good morning. Hi. Morning. Um, okay. So I think I won't take up too much of your time uh, because mm -hmm. we only have 10 minutes for you. So uh, we'll get you okay. right on to yep. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this um, this uh, seminar. So today I will be talking about what is it like to be a female scientist in Japan. Just um, give a few minutes on the background, on our work here, um, on our work done, and also why did I choose to be a uh, scientist in Japan. So uh, well, one of the few reasons as to um, what has brought me to this decision was because of the education opportunity as well as the um, scholarship which was offered by the Japanese government. So I was fortunate enough to um, gain access to a scholarship um, and to pass participate as a graduate student in Japan. So um, the research opportunities as well as the technologies in Japan is very attractive. So these are one of the um, reasons why I chose to study and um, develop my field in Japan. So the final reason was because um, there's possibility of cultural exchange. I find that it's a... Um, it's a um, very interesting culture. It's very different from what we have in Malaysia. And um, we can also learn from each of the cultures. For example, um, in Japan, they're very timely. They come, um, they join meetings on time. They have everything, even the train arrives at a particular um, minute. So I, I think these are some of the things, um, the culture-wise and also the language-wise, um, we, we can also learn from um, Japan. So I have about um, 50 15 years of um, experience in Japan. I've been staying since my uh, graduate years here. And after that, I continued my research at the Ministry of Health, um, Labor and Welfare in Japan. And um, later on, after obtaining my uh, PhD degree, so I went on to do my research in Nagasaki University. So one of the um, interesting here thing here is that either than um, other than all the cute anime where you see um, this is how they do the COVID measures in Japan. For example, if they want to do um, uh, if they they want to have um, seating further away from each other, they'll put all this. Um, this is a Pokemon cafe where they have Pikachu's around, and then it's a very it's very organized, very orderly. Everybody gets screened. So these are some of the um, COVID measures which was done in Japan. So um, robotics-wise, it's also quite advanced. And um, these were some of the measures as well which were introduced where they um, have um, lesser uh, customer and people um, um, uh, uh, touching each other. So they, they introduce um, these sort of robotics around. So... Um, my day at the um, Institute of Tropical Medicine, Nagasaki University, typically um, we have graduate students. I'm a professor in the, um, at the Institute of Tropical Medicine. We are also working with um, WHO and also um, we also train um, scientists in other countries, for example, in um, Vietnam, where we conducted training, for example, uh, diagnosis for Zika and also dengue. And also we have um, collaborative research on these arboviruses, the disease which affects much of Southeast Asia in um, many parts of, um, in, in many regions, in, for example, here in Myanmar or in Philippines or even um, with our counterparts in Malaysia um, using the facilities which are available at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, Nagasaki University. So we have also done um, some work um, with uh, COVID-19 for this past uh, year. And um, what we've done is that we looked at what sort of uh, viruses causes the outbreaks in the region. Particularly, we look for the differences of the um, genomic patterns between um, Southeast Asia and also of Japan. And also, um, 
because um, Nagasaki is a port city, there are some um, cruise um, ships which has arrived during early of the pandemic. And there we've also helped in um, diagnosing a COVID-19 in all these um, cruise liners. We've also done international collaboration um, in the early phase of the pandemic where there's um, not much coordination in what sort of tests to use, uh, what is good for diagnosis. We've also helped um, in building capacity in the region. So um, as of date, uh, we are also doing uh, research on vaccine therapeutics, as well as basic research as to why the disease causes is much more severe in some people, but not as severe in um, some other patients. So other than that, we also work closely uh, with uh, Vietnam. So uh, because we have a Vietnam station, research station in Nagasaki University. So we also identified the um, first microencephaly case in Southeast Asia. And this was situation in um, Vietnam where this is associated with Zika virus. So all this collaboration comes together. It's very important to work with other researchers, even though we are in Japan, but we also work in the Southeast Asian region so that all this effort will contribute to the control of infectious diseases in Asia. So what I find in my experience um, as a female researcher, there are societal expectations. Um, you, um, for example, there's marriage, children, there's also nursing um, for the elderly care, and also working conditions. There may be long hours and you, there may be some concerns. There's no stable income, as well as the um, workforce in Japan by age, by women, typically falls at the age between 30 and 40s. And there are lesser manager posts um, for women. Um, for example, it's less than 10% um, in the um, political section. So um, I think for science, um, importantly, there's no male or female thoughts in science. So um, you either think scientifically or non-scientifically, there's no um, difference between male or female science um, thinking um, in, in, in science. So um, as a female researcher, we have to be strong, courageous, and hopeful. So despite all this um, environment, there may be some stereotyping background um, in, in behind there, but you have to be hopeful. You have to develop your skill sets and be confident as well as grow out of your comfort zone. So you have to continue learning new skill sets and also you have to be strong and confident in what uh, your skill sets and how you can contribute in science. So I believe equity starts with us. It also starts with you. So um, with that, uh, I would like to end my um, introduction part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Moy, for that very uh, inspiring speech and making Malaysians proud uh, in Japan. Okay. Up next, we have Associate Professor Dr. Chan Yok Fan, the Head of Department for Medical Microbiology at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Her research has been focused on enterovirus A71, an emerging virus that causes severe neurological disease and hand, foot and mouth disease. Specifically, she is developing vaccines, antivirals and education tools for this highly preventable disease common in children. Dr. Chan leads a virology laboratory with research interest in epidemiology and pathogenesis of emerging viruses such as enterovirus A71, chikungunya, and respiratory viruses. Last year, she received the ASEAN US Science Prize for Women. This and many other awards have given her the opportunity to promote women in science in Malaysia. Please put your hands together for Dr. Chan. Right, Dr. Chan. So I think uh, we'll allow you to uh, proceed. Uh, we have your slides ready, so we'll get the slides up and then we can uh, proceed. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you. So um, today I'm happy to be with you to actually uh, talk about my career as a virologist. Next slide, please. So why do we pursue viral, uh, virology? Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, can I have the next slide? 
So uh, we know that um, the truth is why virology is so interesting is because there are actually many Nobel laureates that actually want uh, uh, Nobel laureates because they work on infectious diseases. So I have highlighted here some of the Nobel laureates uh, over 100 years. So let me walk you through, for example, um, in 100 years ago, we have Ronald Ross, who actually worked on malaria, Robert Koch, which was work on tuberculosis, of course, the famous Alexander Fleming, um, who, who discovered uh, penicillin, uh, Max Tyler yellow fever, David Baltimore um, uh, on tumor viruses, Peter Tohoti on viral immune system, Stanley Pusino on discovery of prions, and Barry Marshall um, on uh, her disc his discovery on association of gastric ulcer with helicobacter pylori and um, more importantly is more recently in the last uh, two decades we have female Nobel laureates uh, uh, Professor Sinosi who actually discovered HIV and of course to Yu uh, from China who actually discovered therapy for malaria so with this actually uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, female uh, who actually won Nobel laureates in virology and uh, in microbiology. Next slide, please. So in Malaysia, we also give an award, a uh, Komodeka award, which actually, uh, you know, uh, is a recognition of innovation and excellence in science. So if you see uh, over the past few years, you could also see that uh, we also award um, uh, you know, prize for microbiology very frequently. So these are just some of the highlights. For example, uh, we have Professor He Bejo from UPM who discovered, uh, who actually made a chicken disease vaccine. Uh, Professor Babil Singh and as well as Timothy William who works on malaria and uh, Professor Datin Patuka Katija who works on Newcastle disease virus and now using that to make COVID vaccine. And of course, uh, 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 the 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 more uh, uh, retired professors like uh, Dr. Lim, Professor Mark Junwa, they work on vector-borne diseases as parasitic diseases many, many years ago. And uh, um, the more important, um, the first one, which is 208, was given to Nipah Virus Encephalitis Team, which is from Faculty of Medicine. So all these uh, people actually work on different microorganisms, uh, also in virology field. Next slide, please. So uh, what do we do in virology? So you can actually see, um, we can actually work on, uh, you know, microbiology or virology in the field of medicine, food production, environmental science, as well as public health, just to name a few. So um, where do we actually work? Uh, it could be a hospital, it could be university, it could be industry, it could also be just in the laboratory itself. And what do people call us? People call us clinical microbiologists if we have a, 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 a medical degree. People call us uh, infectious disease physician if we actually have a medical degree and specialize in infectious disease. And we could be an academic to be professor. Uh, we could be scientists. And um, we could also be in the industry as a QA manager. Okay, so next slide, please. So how do we... Um, biologists or microbiologists change the world then. So we help to answer questions pertaining to, you know, uh, uh, from environment to medicine. So for example, some of the things that we actually have done are like uh, understand how microbes help to keep our body healthy uh, and uh, what microbe makes animals sick, you know. So uh, not just human sake, but we are also interested in animals. What make uh, food products spoil? What uh, what microbes specifically can be used to clean the pollution? So we can also help to diagnose COVID positive, which what Dr. Moy has uh, uh, eluded. You know, we can help to understand transmission of vector-borne diseases. We can help to understand, you know, which COVID variants actually escape uh, immunity. We can help to discover viruses, as as in how we discover HIV, papilloma viruses, and association with different things. For example. Uh, HPV, cervical cancer, and we can actually make diagnostic kit, uh, you know, better, faster, uh, easier to use, for example, COVID test. Next slide, please. So now I'll share with you, you know, how I journey through um, uh, as a virologist and why did I pursue virology as well. So um, it's back then, uh, 997. Uh, that slide, uh, keep back that slide, please. Yeah, so thanks. 
So um, you can actually see, you know, uh, I started my career probably uh, 20, 20 years ago uh, where I did my undergraduate and uh, subsequently pursued my PhD. And then uh, I stayed on to actually start my lab and then uh, grow my lab, uh, train different graduates. And then after that, uh, winning awards as well. Next slide, please. So a little bit, um, yeah, this is a picture. I actually did uh, my Bachelor of Biomedical Science in uh, uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, majoring in medical microbiology uh, for a, a three years course. And uh, um, I will, and subsequently, uh, next click please. And I actually went on to do my PhD in uh, Department of Medical Microbiology in Molecular Virology on Android 71 with a scholarship from MOSD. So uh, this very proud moment where we actually graduate with, uh, you know, about 200 PhDs uh, then in 2006. Next slide, please. So uh, after 2005, uh, my first job was actually I was in the industry. So I have the opportunity to actually have a taste of, uh, you know, what is biotech all about in Sandabi Technology Center. Um, and I was there for two years before I actually joined my current job as a junior lecturer, moving on to, uh, from junior lecturer to senior lecturer, and then now uh, as associate professor, and then to um, uh, the head now. So there are many um, ups and downs to my career, of course. You know, uh, needless to say, you know, we have a lot of rejection, uh, you know, life full rejection, grant rejection, paper rejection postgraduate uh, drop off, you know, brain drain. But there are also a lot of great things that happens uh, throughout my career. Like uh, I get the opportunity to build my lab, you know, winning grants, uh, graduating students that make me proud, uh, publishing papers that make an impact, and of course, winning awards, which have been mentioned by Sean. So with this, I will end uh, with my video. And I think it's important in whatever career we pursue, we strive for excellence. With that, uh, enjoy my video and thank you so much. Honored to represent Malaysia. In the last decade, the world has witnessed pandemic flu, Zika and Ebola, epidemics, and now COVID-19. Infectious diseases remain the leading cause of mortality and morbidity in ASEAN. This stressed the need for preventive health care for disease prevention. I'm Yupeng Chan, Associate Professor and Head of Department of Medical Microbiology. Dr. Chan is currently working on antivirus A71, a virus that causes hand, foot and mouth disease and brain infection in children. 30% population in ASEAN are children. High fatality caused by EV A71 has affected many ASEAN countries. Prevention is better than cure. My research will help to combat HFMD. In the laboratory, my team has developed EVA-71 vaccine with codon optimization strategy. This vaccine shows good protective immune responses in animals. I have two patents for development of antiviral peptides and morpholinos. My study to understand the autophagy machinery and its drug target has backed Laurier UNESCO for Women in Science Malaysia and International Rising Talent. In the community, I work with experts from early childhood education to develop educational modules and to create better awareness on HFMD. Together with computer scientists, I'm studying the jaw spatial distribution of HFMD to further understand how it works. I work closely with ADNES to enhance virus surveillance in us. What will provide me with more opportunities to communicate science from the lab to the community? I believe such sharing is important to encourage more interest in STEM. We've got to have more role model in science. The world needs science. Science needs women. HFMD is a disease that can be prevented. Scientists like her continues to make discoveries and translate research to impact the society. Thank you so much, and um, I hope you uh, now finally understand uh, the role of a virologist in society. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chan, for the interesting insight of being a virus hunter. Okay, so for uh, 
those of you who are joining us live, uh, either on Facebook or YouTube, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please do put them in the comment section and then we will uh, highlight them out for you and get the speakers to uh, reply to them at the end when we have a Q&A session, okay? So for any question for any of the four speakers, please put them in the comment section, okay? All right. Uh, next, we have Associate Professor Dr. Wan Wadatol Amani, Binti Wan Salim, Binti Wan Salim, an Associate Professor in the Department of Biotechnology Engineering at the Faculty of Engineering of the International Islamic <coughs> University of Malaysia. She's a leading multidisciplinary engineer and researcher, project manager, and educator with a background in nanotechnology, biomedical, electrical, and materials mm -hmm. engineering. Dr. Amani has worked with projects mm -hmm. under domain-leading organizations such as NASA, National Institute of Health, NIH, and Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, in the United States of America. Now, driving sustainable with radical innovation in Malaysia with a view towards global impact. While COVID-19 was ravaging the entire globe last year, Dr. Amani was the principal investigator to a COVID-19 task force revolutionizing rapid test kits to replace conventional uh, real-time PCR. We are grateful for her pre-recording uh, her talk for us despite her packed schedule focusing on critical research. Let's listen to her pre-recorded talk now. Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Dr. Amani, and today I'll be talking on the topic of importance of diversity in innovation. So this talk uh, is in conjunction with um, Minggu Science Negara um, and organized, of course, by the Tech Dome Penang. Uh, thank you, Sean, for inviting me. Uh, Penang's Women's Development Organization, of course, the Penang State Government. I'm a Penangite, by the way, so I'm very excited to give this talk. So uh, the topic today is very, very dear to me. It's very important, especially currently I am involved in a startup endeavor that requires diversity of talents and minds to actually develop an innovation to solve um, um the testing issue of the current pandemic that we are in. So first of all, we have to understand um, why diversity is important in innovation. One of them is that uh, if you look at the current situation and the pandemic situation we are now, is that the problems that we are facing are very complex. Most of the problems of the world are very, very complex. Therefore, because problems are complex, it requires us to have a diverse perspective, um, interpretations of the problem, providing different solutions, and of course, coming up with predictive models and so forth, requires uh, diversity in terms of talents, cognition, and so forth. So this is why I think that I uh, dearly believe that diversity innovation is very, very important to solve uh, complex problems. Another note is that for me is that uh, when I develop my startup, it's important to have um, this inclusiveness of this varied culture. We come from various culture, we come from various backgrounds, and coming with um, this inclusivity of this varied culture in an organization actually are very, very important because we are different, uh, we are unique, therefore we, inclusivity of women, introverts or extroverts are very, very important. Um, in innovation. So therefore, um, I think that conversations on diversity is very, very important uh, for innovation to thrive. So um, I say this not because just um, we can just make regulatory support for innovations to thrive, but also um, it has to be a normative acceptance in society. As you can see, one example is, is Japan, for example. So therefore, uh, making regulatory support alone um, is good, but it is not enough. So having the normative acceptance, acceptance is very, very important to, for diversity to thrive. And I also think that diversity can help in times of adversity, such as where we are now, because multiple uh, people with talent uh, and skills can be involved in working together to develop solutions. 
And one example we can see is uh, the Apple Diversity uh, is basically the company that we can, um, you know, um, learn from. Where now is that, uh, based on the uh, statistics that is I got online is that 45% of leaders under 30 uh, are women and 17% 17, 17 are underrepresented minorities. So these companies like Apple, for example, is actually pushing um, diversity to thrive the company to be the most innovative company. So how do we engineer diversity? So I believe that bringing people with different perspective are very important and having that interdisciplinary efforts in solving problems um, because um, this diverse preference of people can be beneficial, even though you come with various diverse perspective, but then all of these diverse perspective works towards a common goal can actually benefit people with a diverse uh, preference and experience. Uh, therefore, the recruitment practice should embrace diversity. Uh, that includes uh, not only we tend to talk about gender and so which is very, very important, but also uh, cognitive diversity in, all, in order for the organization to thrive. So we are in a world now coping with the COVID-19 and we can see that I'm um, just show you snippets of the news. I don't to say that, um, you know, uh, we all know how important the situation uh, for uh, how important this current um, pandemic is for us STEM community to learn. And even though we talk about vaccines is that, um, you know, there's no silver bullets. Uh, vaccine is no silver bullets. You can see that, you know, um, um, still we have to do um, a lot of um, testing and, and, and tracking and so forth. Besides, of course, uh, having to delivering vaccines will take a while for the population even in Malaysia, okay? So our team believe that, you know, even though uh, vaccine is, uh, you know, everybody gets excited about that, but at the same time, we have to be aware that um, testing is also important. So when the first breakout of Wuhan happened is that I, you know, quickly um, gather a team of um, scientists, um, uh, business people and engineers to come together to basically develop a new nano rapid test kit to provide solutions for the uh, limitations in the RT-PCR for uh, testing cap capability in this country. So what, what does our team do is that we develop this nano rapid test kit to basically provide uh, capability of detection that is compatible to RT-PCR, but also much lower, lower cost. That's our value proposition and cannot be done without this diverse team. So again, uh, my experience in um, Malaysia academia is that we are highly engrossed in the KPI driven rating system. We talk about graduate on time a lot, all of these metrics that we use to evaluate our achievement. At the same time, we have to also ask ourselves, um, are these inculcating, um, you know, uh, values such as um, diversity in our organization, which actually can create sustainability of talents um, in academia itself. So I learned this a lot from my experience as a project leader at NASA, of course, where we, as you can see, that the organization itself embraces diversity, you not know, only of it's not about just, uh, uh, it's not about, uh, you know, you have more females or male, it's nothing like that. It's about having the, the best talents to come forward to solve um, relevant problems. So just to show that um, how diversity are involved in, in our uh, work is that since beginning, when I start with, before I went to the, uh, as a project, uh, a principal investigator of the project for uh, Sportsat, which is, you can read about it online, is that, you know, we've worked along with a very diverse, diverse team. My, uh, the, the professor during that time, which I engage uh, in are really, really, uh, pushing this diversity forward. And this is one of the reasons that, you know, um, we get to work with people of different backgrounds and so forth and bringing in uh, the different perspective to bring solutions to the problems. Uh, we get, to, of course, to see the astronauts, you know, during uh, that time, it was really, really uh, fun. Um, especially this, this is design of the satellite, as you can see here, uh, it comes from diverse uh, 
solutions from a very uh, diverse team, you know, from the universities, from the NASA and industries and so forth to come up with a solution. And we come up with this bio CD, which is a sensor, multiple sensor platform that was uh, integrated into the satellite and that comes with uh, diverse talents and so forth to develop such systems. And this is the reason why, because we bring in all the talents and so forth that we um, successfully launched the nano satellite uh, that was in Cape Canaveral. Florida, and we have uh, fun in doing our work because even though we have differing opinions and so forth, but then uh, because we understand that this diverse opinion is what makes the projects a success. So we learn to work together in team, and I think that's very, very important to for innovation to basically prosper. Came back to IIUM, built my lab, you know, um, so forth, and um, get to see things problem on the ground all of these are huge huge problems that we solve okay and now i'm building the malaysian uh, one of malaysian shot which is basically um, i hold by these words from um, which i truly uh, i mean truly uh, inspired by is that we do the things we do because not because it is easy but because it is hard okay you attack huge problems with a breakthrough technology, radical solution, that moonshot requires that diversity. Okay, so I'm not gonna go about this, read a bit about inspiration to that and to build the organization, we have all of these talents under one roof. And that's very important to have this diversity for things to uh, develop the things that we are trying to develop now. So I think that's all uh, from me and if you have any more questions on my topic, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Amani, for continuing to break barriers locally and abroad. Our final speaker for today is Associate Professor Dr. Chia Pixi, who is currently the Chair of the International Brain Research Organization Asia Pacific Research Committee, IBRO APRC. She is an anatomist and neuroscientist with a research focus on identifying and understanding the function of causative genes for neurodevelopmental disorders and neuropsychiatric diseases. As an active member of Malaysian Society of Neurosciences, MSN, and Young Scientist Network Academy of Sciences, Malaysia, YSN, ASM, as well as being chair of IBRO EPRC, she helps to promote collaborative networks between clinical and non-clinical neuroscientists, as well as to improve the quality of the neuroscience research in Malaysia and internationally. Dr. Chia is with us today, but to ensure a smooth presentation, she has opted to pre-record her talk, but she will join us for the Q&A session if you have any questions for her later. Let's listen to her talk now. Uh, let's hold on for a while. Let's wait for, uh, while we get her uh, video ready. Distinguished guests, speakers, of women in science, and our fellow young talents of Malaysia. Here is Dr. Pixie from University Putra, Malaysia. As one of the women in science in the 21st century, I'm glad to share with you a small science story of mine on how much I love science. STEM education is important. It is the key contributor for building and maintaining the development of any successful country. It helps to improve economy, healthcare system, and even in infrastructure. During the COVID-19 pandemic, with the enormous effort of scientists, healthcare workers, and the frontliners, we are able to detect the infected individuals, we learn the SOP, and now we have vaccines to protect us from the infection. However, further look into the STEM education and career, unfortunately, there is still a huge science gender gap. Women are dropping out from this career. There are many factors behind it. Today, hopefully, with my little story, I'm able to spark interest among the young talents of Malaysia to opt for STEM education. 
Here's Dr. Pixi, very happily involved as a teacher in the university, as a scientist in the lab, and collaborate with the industry and in the survey of science and enjoy sharing knowledge with the community. So first, let's have a look in the Dr. Pixi in the classroom. In the faculty of Uh, okay. Let's wait for a while. Uh, something is wrong with the video there. Okay. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, put uh, your questions in the comment section and we'll get the speakers to address them later. Okay. So you can ask anything that you like. How is it like in Japan? So the problem I can uh, teach This is uh, how uh, we actually remove the problem of the brain and we can study the brain structure in detail we also can remove the spinal cord that we can study the spinal nerves besides the real human samples we also perform the virtual dissection during this COVID-19 we have lots of e-learning online classes so I can perform this um, online dissection remove the skin the muscle and the bone of the human and can review the brain enlarge it and I can even uh, have a virtual plate to remove the blood vessels so that we can see the brain in detail. We also have interactive 3D models to facilitate the teaching. And with the, another fun way of teaching is the simulation method. Just like something CSI while training the young forensic anthropologists in the field. We also look for the site that we can bury the specimen and we can teach the young trainees on how to excavate the bodies without um, damaging the specimen. Another fun way is to use the mnemonics to help the student to remember complicated medical terminologies. For example, here is showing the right brain and the left brain a function dominant. Right brain is dominant in a few function, which is so colorful and engaged in artistic activities. Right brain is important for eye function, I for imagination, N for music, A for art, and C for creativity. Whereas on the left side of the brain, it is important for three L function, L for language, L for logical reasoning, and L for linear. So hopefully within five seconds, you are able to remember the four function of the right brain and three function of the left brain, which are each of them dominant. In the classroom, I learned a lot from my students. You can see here that they are making these right brain and left brain models, in which uh, this right brain and left brain model was also brought for an uh, exhibition in the KLESF in 2016. So while joining the Young Scientist Network under the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, we showcase different brain exhibits, and this right left brain is one of the popular exhibits of the day. And we also have a gamification in the classroom. We have fun while motivating students in answering different quizzes. Students can use their mobile and answer the questions posted, and they can compete with each other, knowing their score, competing, improve their ranking by answering faster. They're so excited and engaged. So this is the teaching part of me in the university. Well, in the lab, I am working as a scientist, as a neuroscientist. Neuroscience is a field allowed me to learn diseases, disorders, and treatment of the human brain. My foundation of neuroscience was started in UPM and UKM. Then I have a postdoctoral training in Australia for neurobiology, developmental neurobiology. Then lately, I also a further um, training in a Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in the United States in which we focus on the gene therapy targeting the tuberous sclerosis complex. We published this work early this year. This is actually written uh, in the complicated um, hardcore science language. We also wrote another articles in the layman terms so that we can share with the news network and um, so that the community can share the knowledge and breakthrough happening in the lab. Back in Malaysia, I and my husband, we have, uh, we call it the one group called Neurobiology and Genetics Group, NBGG, in which uh, we train postgraduate students and interns. Here are the students from Malaysia, Iran, Iran, Nigeria, 
from uh, USA and Turkey. Our focus is studying the genetic disorders on the central nervous system, focusing on the Down syndrome model. Knowledge sharing is always fun. I enjoy traveling around the world to share science with the scientists and also the young talents. And of course, uh, I'm having a science slam is another experience that uh, while everyone is enjoying the drinks and nibbles, we talk about brains and neuroscience. So while we know that um, left brain dominance is for logical reasoning, that's what I used to do when I share the um, scientific talks with uh, all the scientists from Asia Pacific region. So uh, last year, while I was uh, last two years when I was in India as an invited speaker, so after I'm um, giving the talks, so I also have a chance to join the Chandigarh uh, Crafts Mela, which I found that my right brain function. scientists can dance it was featured in the local news on the next day it was really an, an uh, unforgettable moment uh, with dancing with all these professional dancers as a neuroscientist i also engaged myself in the non-profit organization to promote neuroscience and to increase brain awareness i i, I have joined the international brain research organization ebro um, to help to promote neuroscience around the world. Here are the 10 core values of Ebro. And I would like to draw your attention to the last two values that the diversity and inclusiveness is where we try to increase women's involvement in neuroscience and also the minorities in neuroscience research. Last month, we proudly celebrated the International Women's Day. And here I'm showing the president of Ebro and my fellow uh, chairs and friends from different regions, from Pan Europe, United uh, USA, Canada, Latin America, and uh, Africa, and myself from Asia Pacific region. The Asia Pacific region so far has four chairs. First was from China, uh, from Hong Kong. Second was from Japan, and last year's from from Korea, and now. I am chairing the, the research committee and with my fellow friends here, we hope that we can continue to promote neuroscience in Asia Pacific region. So besides working in the lab, we also collaborate with the industry in collaboration with the biotechnology companies involved in gene therapy. We have advanced our gene therapy uh, therapeutic approach from the animal models to a higher animal model in the non-primate uh, uh, model. So hopefully uh, with more encouraging data, we are able to advance this gene therapy targeting to tuberous sclerosis complex into the clinical trial phase one. Finally, coming to the last part of the talk is I would like to share with you with the community service in, uh, in my life. That uh, from time to time, we have the neuro fair, Besides uh, sharing the knowledge with the university students, we also invite our young talents um, to come and learn about the brain, learn about human anatomy in the school campus. And we also participate in the different brain exhibition to share the knowledge with the general public. And here you can see that um, how Dr. Kong, Sean, and Dr. Wong, all of them are part of the big person, big pillar, the important people to drive the STEM education in Malaysia. Of course, uh, my love to the community, not just limited to the school children and the university students, but also to the elderly. So I enjoy the uh, science sharing session with the elderly in which they are really a great participants. They enjoy learning how to have a healthy aging, how to, how to keep their brain agile. It was fun talking science with them. So here's the end of the story of uh, Dr. Pixie. So um, I hope that we, we appreciate the idea is the world needs science and science needs women. For well, that, I end my talk today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Chia, uh, for that fascinating uh, talk and also, you know, 
giving us more insight to the thing in our head, which is so crucial to our human functionality. Okay. So uh, I can see that you are now in your brain, <laughs> that there's a brain thing there, and behind you, you have your neurons and things like that. Okay, All right. Yeah, that's not a real brain, right? That's, that's just a model, right? It's just a model. <laughs> yeah, okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I could I could hear the thunder. So like what you're saying that your internet connection will get bad uh, when it rains. So that's why you have to pre-record it. So throughout your presentation, I could hear the thunder, 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 thunder in the background. Okay. Uh, I don't see uh, any um, questions coming from <laughs> the students uh, on Facebook and comments. Uh, there's a lot of chat chatter going around. Uh, but there are no questions. So maybe I shall start off with one question. Um, maybe you all can share with us uh, what are the challenges like uh, being, uh, you know, women in science? Uh, earlier today, we heard from the CEO of PWDC that uh, when she wanted to recruit to be a reserve, re reservist, uh, uh, she saw that all the images, everything, all the collaterals were about men so there were no women featured so she had to briefly go up and ask uh, is this open for uh, girls also or only boys and and that's where she started uh, to, to participate when they told her yes it's also open so what are the challenges that you all face uh, is, it, is it different in Japan or is it is it more inclusive in Japan uh, is it any different, uh, Dr. Chia, you have been to US and so forth. Uh, can you all make comparisons? Uh, how is it like? What are the challenges that you have faced? Uh, any, anyone can start? Yeah, I, I think I can kickstart this. Uh, so I think the challenges everywhere is different. It's a whole lot of different challenges uh, between female researchers in different regions. And um, for example, in Japan, there's societal expectations uh, where they expect uh, female uh, females to um, stay at home or maybe take care of kids. There's also families to look after. So I think um, it, it's also not just up to the responsibilities of the I, I, either sex, again. It's also the responsibility of yourself to prove that as a role model, you should also work to whatever... Uh, this this um, optimal image that you have in mind. So if you want to work in science, uh, so I previously highlighted there's no male or female in science. That's just whether you are thinking scientifically or not. So this is where you put um, your skill sets. This is where you present yourself as the confident next generation leader. I'm sure you, um, women are also very capable of doing that and to show that uh, you are the one which is capable of carrying out all these responsibilities as the next generation scientist. So I sincerely think that it's possible for the younger generation to do that. So um, if you think that's a, that is a glass ceiling, then there's a glass ceiling. But if you think that you, it's possible for you to break through the glass ceiling, then um, it is up to you. And it's also up to how you influence the surroundings to break whatever barriers that there is there. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Chan or Dr. Um, well, I, I do agree with um, uh, Professor Moy. I think uh, everything starts from you. And uh, of course, I think the challenge between um, for male and female are always different. So uh, of, I totally agree with, uh, I think in Asia, um, society expect you know female to take the burden of child care uh, of course we have to do child labor so so we we, we have a lot of uh, you know uh, care duties to do uh, female actually most of the time actually have to do that I always remember you know um, that's a picture that a meme that people put up you know where we actually run a race you know where you have females and males and why male reach their first because you know there were so many barriers um, in between the women you know including you know household chores uh, uh, child labor child care um, elderly care and so on so it but but then 
those are obstacles, but it's not a, a complete uh, stop block that, that it's just a hurdle, a small hurdle, but um, you know, it's something that we can jump across and, and leapfrog it slowly. So um, what, what I would love to see, of course, you know, it's like uh, in Asia, we maybe we, um, I think female uh, pursuing science will maybe less uh, similar. It will soon be very similar to also, uh, you know, overseas. And uh, you know that the Western countries have very strong policy, for example, they, they put up policies such as, you know, uh, uh, to not count, I mean, you, you take the time off for a number of years, you know, you actually uh, uh, have childcare and things like that. And, 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 and uh, you know, you, you actually get um, your, your career pathway um, has a, you know, you can kickstart it later uh, after, um, you know, that uh, you, you actually have uh, passed your childbearing age. You you actually take time off. That that is a lot. But at the moment, I think in Asia, that that is still really lacking. And I hope you know policy will soon kickstart to change that. And um, the other thing that uh, 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 like what we say, things starts from us. You know, it is also each and every one. You know, female engaged female to be part of you know scientific community. Uh, uh, for example, you know, if you organize a meeting, so you make sure you you actually have, you know, a good representative of gender equality. Most of the time, I think somehow, somewhere, you know, the ratio tends to be not equal. And sometimes it's, 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 it's due to us, we, we, we didn't make an effort. So, so again, I think that's something we need to learn from Western country and they make an effort, you know, to make, gender equality a, a, a policy so so i think that's two things that are uh, as a you know way forward uh in terms of policy that's what we can do and of course you know uh we have here pixie moy and and of course uh, dr amani so we as the icon as i mean female in stem i think uh you know we always take every single opportunity to to actually highlight our work uh to actually showcase like like what you say you know be a role model anywhere we go to okay Thank you, Dr. Chia. Uh, Dr. Chia. hi i could not agree anymore yeah, with uh, prof moi and prof chan uh, on this topic it's so interesting we we aware that they are they are obstacles they are problems that's why uh, so with the with the ebro international brain research organization we have a special grants to support the women whenever the women go when they go for the maternity leave we have a special career break um, fundings to fund their proposals to help them to get through what they have lacking behind because they are losing some time in between in their career which is so important so um, this is how we try to acknowledge the, the problem and we, we do help them out. Another one is a very interesting lately. Uh, we also give a special funding to help uh, whenever there's uh, scientific talks. We give a special funding to the organizers so that they, have, uh, uh, they can have a nursing care during the scientific talks so that the parents, the mom can bring along the kids so they at the same time kids can have a special care during the scientific events we have special game we have a special carers for them and the mom as a scientist can still enjoying the, the the talk at the same time it's a family event that we try to engage the family and we try to instill this value yeah in in different levels so we try to involve everyone and of course uh, we also have a uh, um, because now we're sitting in the committee reviewing lots of proposals to host different scientific meetings. Like what Prof Chan uh, um, mentioned, it's so important that we ensure the organizers, it should be have a, have a e e equal, equal contribution from the female committee members, even from the speakers as well. So this is how we try to try to reach out. And we are one of the women in science in 21st century trying to do to help the young scientists coming so that we can encourage more of them to join us in the STEM education. Yeah, that's all from me, Sean. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chia. Um, looks like we need to wrap things up. Uh, the, the 
kids have to join their parallel workshops. We have seven parallel workshops happening yes, at, from I 9 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you very much once again, uh, Prof Moy, Dr Chan, Dr Chia, and also Dr Armani, who uh, not able to join us uh, today for being part of uh, Women in Science 2021. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Thank you. All right, everyone, uh, it's going to be 11 soon. So for those who are joining us here, you'll be joining our uh, TRIS uh, workshop uh, conducted by TRIS Malaysia. So we'll be starting shortly. So uh, just uh, wait for a minute, OK? Uh, and we'll be uh, getting our speaker, Dr. Isaac, to come on in a bit, OK? Stay tuned.
Bila kita dah mula belajar dalam bidang kejuruteraan, kita ada ya yeah, the foundations of science and maths yang membantu kita untuk mengatur pentadbiran dan urusan-urusan program kenegaraan yang memuatkan keperluan dalam bidang dan dunia yang memerlukan lebih ramai lagi scientists and science experts. And Leg right on the neck. We can look at her arm. I got it. Welcome back. Um, so up next, we have a workshop from Trees Malaysia. Uh, so I would like to pass on to Dr. Isaac so that he can start on his workshop. If you have any questions uh, that you and you want to ask Dr. Isaac, please post them in the comment section, uh, either on Facebook or YouTube. We'll collate the information and then we will get Dr. Isaac to uh, uh, answer them. Okay. So uh, without further ado, uh, 
let me bring on Dr. Isaac. All right. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, TechDome Penang, for inviting uh, us. So I'm representing Mind Trees, Malaysia Trees Innovation Association, and thanks, thanks so much, Sean, for for organizing, and coordinating. Uh, so many different schools, so many different organizations are involved in this uh, National Science Week. So I'm very, very glad to be here to be sharing with with uh, all of you in school. So first of all, welcome back to school. I believe that you have a six months holiday and uh, everything has been virtual but interestingly now that you're back physically in school you're now in a virtual talk but i guess this will be some sort of new norm for at least another year or so but anyway so just hang on a moment as i share my slides and now this will be a little bit strange in a way because uh, yeah usually in talks i could actually see the expressions and get, engage with you directly uh, but now there's only some sort of like one way yeah one way so yeah so that's a bit tricky now um okay just hang on a moment as i'm trying to share my slides here okay all right, as uh, Sean mentioned as well, uh, if you have any questions, it'd be great. But because I'm using a single screen, so um, it would be great if you could keep all of your questions at the end of the uh, at the end of the talk. Or if you do have any urgent questions, perhaps then uh, Sean could actually uh, highlight that to me. And you can just WhatsApp me that. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm going. All right. So okay. So you can see my full screen now, Sean. If you can see my full screen and you can hear me well, could you just give me some feedback? Yeah, because I believe the students do not have uh, the microphone or camera on. Yeah. Uh, okay. We can see awesome. your screen. Uh, if you could okay. click on the height, height uh, this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. All right. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so let's begin. Thank you very much. So as I mentioned, I'm representing this association called My Trees, and so our role and our passion has been uh, to go around sharing about an innovation methodology, so on, on ways to innovate. So for today's talk, we'll be talking about how to be an innovator, regardless whichever field that you choose to to be an expert in in the future. So you need innovation in whatever field. Right. If you want to be an engineer, if you want to be a chef, if you want to be an accountant, if you want to be a businesswoman or businessman, uh, you would need to be an innovator. Okay. So today's sharing is just an overview to 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 provide you with a tool for you to sharpen your innovation skills. All right. So let's start off with this over here. So what we have is four shapes. Okay. So this is a very quick personality test. And these are the four shapes. We have a square, a circle, a triangle, and a wavy line. So for the next few moments, just decide for yourself, right? You need not share with your friends. Just decide for yourself which shape you like the most. Just choose one, okay? Don't worry, I'm not grouping you into groups to do workshops and exercises. No, it's not that. But just pick one. So naturally, all of us will gravitate towards one. All right? So okay, now I'll give the explanation now. And uh, for whoever that chose square, you are a person who likes system, all right? So for example, if you are given an assignment by your teachers, you would actually like to have a step-by-step -step approach towards it. And you actually read all of the lines of the assignment in the assignment sheet, all right? Uh, for those who are circle, you are a people person. So for example, given a group assignment, you although you are the leader, but you will get everyone's uh, agreement and then you'll move forward. So those are circle people. Uh, you are a people person, okay? Those who choose circle. Uh, those who choose triangle, uh, these are some sort of natural leaders. You, for you, leading is comes quite naturally. And uh, oftentimes, we mistaken those who are the most vocal, those who are the loudest in the group to be the leader, but not necessarily so. Sometimes the quiet one is watching in the background. And when things go, uh, go in the wrong direction, this person will come in and uh, set things right. Okay, now finally, uh, those any one of you choose the squiggly line, the wavy line. Now, for those who chose the wavy line, uh, the definition is this crazy. Okay, so you're crazy creative, you're a risk taker, so you're willing to try and, and go the path that is less taken. And the thing is this 
is that interestingly, when I when I do these quick tests on different government agencies, different uh, different departments, uh, different uh, companies, what I see is usually the head of departments, the general managers, the CEOs, they are wavy lines. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, if you're wavy line, uh, crazy creative, that's fantastic. Okay. Now, but for us to deliver innovation, we need a group of different personalities. Those who are systematic, those who are square, those who are uh, also harmonious with their team members or circle, those who will take lead when there are uncertainty or when there are tough times, a triangle. And we need someone to take risks. So, a uh, wavy line. So, those are personalities. But Oftentimes, we, we cannot just rely on our personality. We need some tools to guide us, to help us, okay? So now, let's go through and take a look at some of the greatest innovators in our lifetime, all right? Uh, so over here, this very young, young, uh, young founders of a company. So I believe you would, you would, you would, you would recognize the person on the right side. Uh, that's actually Bill Gates when he was younger. And which company did they found? Microsoft, okay? So, okay, let's look at the next company. So these are two co-founders of a very, very large company, a very popular company. I think most of you would have seen their products before as well. The person on the right side is actually Steve Jobs, okay? And uh, with him is Steve Wozniak. Together they came up, they invented the first personal computer. Okay. And so Apple logo. Back then it was Isaac Newton sitting under the Apple tree. So that was the original Apple logo. And then they simplified into the beaten Apple that we know now. Okay. So that's that. Let's look at the next uh, founders of a very large company. So over here, these are friends uh, who are doing their PhD in the college in a university together, and they came up to form a company. And because they did not have much money, so what you see here is actually a garage, a storage room. So they have no money to rent an office space. They can only afford to rent a garage, okay? So so this is their first office. And which company did they develop? It's actually Google, all right? So I am sharing all of this to show you that, you know, uh, great companies all start very humble. So, for example, if we look at Microsoft, they were high school friends, okay? So, they were high school friends, and for Apple, they were college friends, and then for Google, they were university friends. So, one thing is when you want to do great things, uh, do not go solo. You need good partners. So, look to the person on your left, look to the person on your right, they are potentially your business partners, okay? To to, to set up the next great uh, tech startup in the world. So never say never, you might never know, okay? Now, let's look to the East, okay? So this one have a team of 18 co-founders. So people over here in the apartment, and if you would recognize uh, the figure in the middle, if you see the top right here, okay? So this is actually Jack Ma and his team of co-founders. And his co-founders are actually his former students. He was teaching English in a college. And he, he got his students to join him to, to develop a startup, an e-commerce uh, company. And that e-commerce company is known as the Alibaba Group. So these are the co-founders. And today they, are, they have uh, different responsibilities and they are CEOs and CEOs of different uh, subsidiaries of the Alibaba Group. Okay. So now, all of these uh, happened in the last like 30 years, 30, 40 years, but all, all of this it will be impossible without one innovator, which is the inventor of the computer, all right? Without the inventor of the computer, we would not have any Alibaba, we will not have any Apple, we will not have any Google or Microsoft. So who is the inventor of the first computer? The first inventor is Grace Hopper, Okay, so without women, we would not have computers, all right? So as this is the Women in Science Week, so we want to pay tribute to Grace Hopper. So besides being a programmer, so she is the first that came, uh, that, that invented the, the computer and also the first to develop a universal programming language, okay? A universal programming language. Uh, besides being a programmer, she is also with the Navy. So she was an admiral, admiral 
Okay, she was with the Navy. So yeah, multitasker, fantastic indeed. All right, so we have to thank Race Hopper uh, for the invention of the computer. Okay, and now all of us are having computers in front of our screen. So some of your teachers are sharing uh, pictures in the WhatsApp group and I see that, wow, you have a fantastic facility in your school. I see there's air conditioning, uh, there's sound system, there's a large projector screen, and most of you are with computers in front of you. That's fantastic. Okay, so we have to thank Grace Hopper for that. So now, now these are the things that we'll go through together. Some, uh, for example, what are the 21st century skills and understanding our personalities and how can we perform as a group, okay? So just a quick overview, what are the skills needed now? Especially with uh, the pandemic or you know, being over, um, we live in the new world, okay? This is new territory. No one has ever experienced this before. And now, Who's this guy in the picture here with this uh, rambutan hairstyle? So this guy over here is Albert Einstein. And I like this statement that he came up with. He says, no problem can be solved by the same level of consciousness that created it. In other words, in simpler terms, it is easier to be a troublemaker than to solve problems. It is easier to create problems than it is to, to solve them, okay? now. The problems that we are facing today are problems that our fathers, our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers have not faced before. We are facing different, different challenges. So therefore, we cannot rely on past solutions. We need to create and we need to invent new solutions. Now, over here is a picture of one of the first um, mass manufactured car. It's called the Model T the Model T, and it was uh, manufactured by a company called Ford, F-O-R-D, and the founder of Ford Motors is actually Henry Ford. And one day, uh, a, 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 reporter was, a reporter was asking him, why are you so successful? And Henry Ford says that I'm successful because I do not listen to my customers. So the reporter was very surprised. Hmm? Uh, but why don't you listen to, to your customers? And this is what Henry Ford asked back. He said, if I were to ask my clients what they want, what would they ask me for? So some of you would say, um, maybe they would ask for a faster car, a cheaper car, a car in different color, a car with, uh, with internet connection, or a car with more media outlets, a better speaker, things like that. So, but no, you have to you have to realize that this is like more than a hundred years ago, where most of people were going around with horse carriages. So, in their mindset, so they wouldn't be asking about a car; they would actually be asking for a faster horse. Okay, so as an innovator, you need to create the market. You need to create the product that no one have have known that they need it, or no one know that they can afford it. So back then, cars were very very expensive to own. But what Ford did was that he manufactured it in such a way that even the, the average income earner could afford one. So how did he do that? His innovation is not in inventing the car. His innovation is in the manufacturing process. That he Before that, every car was tailor-made. So every customer can customize. But what he did was that he mass manufactured. You can only buy the car in black color. You can only buy in this specification. Okay, No other uh, models. Okay, so that is how he brought the cost down. So that was his innovation. Okay, now, when we want to solve a problem, we need to be systematic. We need to have a system. We cannot just rely on, you know, okay, let's go to Starbucks or let's go to, to McDonald's. And then, you know, after drinking some coffee, getting some burgers, we'll be inspired. All right, so that's not really a systematic way. Then we must have a predictable and repeatable way to solve our problems as well. So although we have solved this problem before, can we solve it again and again and again? So yeah, in if we just rely on luck, uh, we might be lucky once or twice, but how can we repeat that? So therefore we need some sort of like a formula. Like in solving your mathematics equations, you need a formula and with the formula, you can arrive to the solution, even though it, uh, there's different types of problems, but you, you are sure that you can arrive to the solution because you have a formula. So when you talk about that formula, uh, that formula that's needed for innovation. Sometimes people say that, okay, we just need to invest in hardware or software. So hardware in terms of equipment for your R&D centers or software, getting the latest AI or, or those with machine learning. 
but that's actually not enough. Investing in great facilities is not enough. You need to invest in your mind. So mind where as well, okay? So if you have spent a lot on uh, your iPhone, you know, on your PlayStation, on your desktop, so if you have invested a lot in uh, getting the latest games, why don't invest in your mind as well, okay? So one thing I observe is that um, uh, among Malaysians, uh, you know, even when I was younger, uh, that we don't read as much, yeah. So we don't in, we don't read as much. We maybe would read our textbook because, you know, our exam is based on that. But we don't read beyond that, okay? We because oftentimes uh, we are not encouraged to pursue what we like. But let's say if you you enjoy something that is not within your subjects in school, let's say you enjoy sailing, all right, or you enjoy fishing, you should go on and read on more about that. Okay, so invest in your mind. So for today's session, I hope that your mind will be like a parachute. Okay, your mind will be like a parachute. A parachute best works when it is open. Okay, so if a parachute is closed, uh, there'll be crash landing. So I hope you will be having an open mind. Okay. Now, so this is uh, over here is Bloom's taxonomy of learning, and oftentimes in in our kindergarten, our primary school, and our High school is oftentimes about this, remembering and understanding, because there are a lot of new terms that you need to, to learn about mathematics, about science. So those, those are very new terms for you guys, so that you need to remember and understand. But moving forward, we have Mr. Google. Okay, so in the working world, once you uh, enter into the industry, um, it's not about your memorization power. It's about how you apply it. So therefore, these days in school, we also have higher order thinking skills, right? H-O-T-S, all right? Higher order thinking skills. So it's not just about, you know, uh, memorizing facts. It's about applying it to solve a certain problem, okay? And now, when you go to university and into the industry, we hope that you would be creating, analyzing, and also evaluating all of your solutions because then, by then, you will need to create new solutions. You cannot refer to the back of the textbook. So now we can, if we do not know the answer, we just open up the textbook, we just look behind. What is the uh, answer? But in the world that we live now, there are new problems and we need to create new solutions. So hopefully you'll be an inventor for new solutions, yeah? Now, this is a recent article which was published uh, at the end of last year uh, during the pandemic, during the height of the pandemic. And these are the 21st century skills. Okay, I like to emphasize here, skills, not knowledge. So these days we live in a world where knowledge is of abundance. Okay, we can get any information online, but then uh, what we need is, is to apply those information. And to apply those information, that's where skills are needed. So when we look in, into schools or colleges and universities is all about literacy numeracy so on and so forth okay uh, but moving forward what would help us to survive uh, in the new economy are these key competency skills all right critical thinking creativity communication and collaboration now let's look at critical thinking and problem solving now as i mentioned that we were, we are facing problems that we have never faced before. And a lot of the jobs that will be created in the future have are not existing at the moment. Even now, the jobs that we have now do not exist 10 years ago. For example, like digital marketing, all right? Not just marketing, but digital marketing. It did not exist 10, 15 years ago. It is a new role, okay? And let's talk about uh, data scientists as well. It is, uh, it is, it is uh, rising up. It is uh, more and more organizations are uh, uh, hiring data scientists, but not so much so 10 years ago, okay? And in the future with AI uh, being able to take over a lot of tasks, a lot of jobs will be redundant. So a lot of jobs will be lost. So we cannot rely on a very specific role. And as we see during the pandemic, those who are in very specific industry, they suffer. Um, so we need to have a wide range of, of uh, areas that we can apply our skills to. So what in whatever area, what are the core skills, competency skills needed in whatever industry we identify to be this for? Critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. But 
if we look at our textbook, you know, you look at our education system, it's not really taught us much about critical thinking and creativity yet. Okay, so that is what hopefully um, you would pick up along the way um, with this methodology that we'll introduce to you, okay, which is called TRIS, T-R-I-C, okay. Um, now, uh, this is another report shown, uh, shared by Bloomberg, and what they have done was that they researched and conducted a survey with over a thousand companies, 1,000 companies, and what they asked them was that, what are the skills uh, that you most desire, but it, it is hardest to find in the market? So that would be the quadrant on the top right, the one in green. So these are the skills that employers want, they desire this, okay? But they, they also find it that that is the hardest to find in the market. So we should be looking at strategic thinking, creative problem solving, leadership and communication skills. Okay, so two different studies, but they all arrived to the same conclusion. In the previous study by World Economic Forum, they identified problem solving creativity. And then over here as well by Bloomberg, it's also the similar skills. Okay, so don't worry too much about technical skills. Those are still needed. Those are still needed, but think about these core competency skills, okay? So with these core competency skills, it doesn't matter whichever industry you enter, these are all needed, okay? Now, just to share with you another interesting, uh, another interesting chart or matrix that I've read from this book by Damron. So over here, he said that in every organization, in every organization, the top performer is the strategic guy, also known as the fire dragon, because this person is great in planning and great in solving. So the y-axis here is those who are great in planning, x-axis is those who are great in solving. Okay, so in every organization, we hope to have a strategic guy, someone great planning, great in solving. And what must we avoid to become? A donkey, which is the bottom left, a problem maker, very bad in planning and very bad in solving. Now, so oftentimes um, when we, when when you first enter the industry next time, oftentimes you would be excited and you have a lot to plan. And so you'll be a, like a paper tiger, all right? A theory person. Very good in planning, but bad in solving because maybe you have less experience or you like to plan, but do not like to get your hands dirty to execute it. So you remain as a theory person. And also on the other end, you would face those in the company who have been there very long, very many years, and those are seniors, all right? So they have a lot of experience of solving the problems because the problem keep happening again, keep reoccurring. So, but they're very bad in planning to prevent the problem. So they are just there every day firefighting. So there's a small fire here, let's solve this, but they're bad in planning. And those are horses, okay? So anyway, the key thing here is that we need to enhance our skills in planning and in solving problems okay so how do we do that so if we look at tools these are mind tools okay these are mind tools that are out there many many different tools and um, our focus will be on this trees on generating solutions because oftentimes um, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, when we talk about problem solving uh, there are a lot of tools that will help us to set the goal but then those tools does not help us to reach the goal. How do we reach the goal? So that is why we need this, all right? Okay, so now, uh, before we go into, you know, where trees came about and whatnot, so what are the success stories? And over here, we have the light bulb. And who's the inventor of the light bulb? Who's the inventor of the working light bulb? It's actually Thomas Edison, right? So he says this, genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. So what he's, he's trying to say is that, you know, um, although you are a genius, but you need to work very hard, very, very hard, okay? So he conducted more than 10,000 experiments just to come up to, just to invent the first working electric light bulb, okay? Now, so now, uh, back then they used a lot of trial and error over 10,000 experiments. So that's a lot of trials. And back then he did have the, the resources and therefore he can. But if you do not have enough resources, you do not have enough resources, how can you then do a lot of experiments? Okay, so how can we reduce the trial and error? 
So which company did Thomas Edison uh, develop? He developed a company, he set up a company called General Electric. So back then, he relied a lot of, of hiring hundreds and thousands of scientists and conducting tens of thousands of experiments, but that's a very resource intensive. So, but now they have General Electric are also using a more systematic way. And what way is that? It's this way, trees, okay. And so how great would it be if we have a way to solve all our problems? Just one method, but it solves all of our problems, like over here. So if you do a quick search, uh, so you can find articles about trees on how Samsung have uh, pivoted on how they have vastly improved from being a mainly a household appliance manufacturer. So they manufactured TVs, refrigerators, rice cookers, and suddenly in the late 1990s, they became a dominant force in the semiconductor industry. So why, why semiconductor industry is very hard to enter is because the semiconductors are like the brains of your machine. So it's very highly complex. So how did they manage to enter into the semiconductor industry and to do really well? Is because they hired a group of trees consultants, okay? And trees is from Russia, so they hired these Russian trees consultants. And then if we do further uh, further search on trees, it has been um, featured in different magazines as well and has mentioned about the top companies in America have been using trees since the 1990s, okay, before you were born, all right? Now, so in Samsung, within the first three years, in the late 1990s, so they hired these uh, Russian engineers and they trained up their engineers in this. And uh, within the first three years, they have uh, gained more than one billion US dollars in return. And over the years, I believe they have gained more tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions, all right? And uh, by the way, the chief engineer, the chief engineer in Samsung is a lady, Dr. Song. So usually we were invited here every two or three years to Malaysia to give a talk. Yeah, but because of the pandemic, we would have to cut down our conference for now. Yeah, but but the head of uh, of the R&D and, and also the development department is actually Dr. Song, which is a lady and she's a trace expert. Now, uh, in Malaysia, one of the first companies to be using trees is actually Intel. So very near to where you are and uh, in Penang. And so, yeah, so in, in fact, the association, My Trees, is actually developed by uh, a group of Intel, uh, Intel team, right? So they have seen that it has benefited them in their work, daily work. So they wanted to share with uh, the universities, with the schools, and I was one of the students as well that received the training from them. And now I'm just uh, passing the gift forward. As just as what they have trained me, I'm now just sharing with you all, okay? And uh, Boeing, so the manufacturer of our airplanes, so they also have uh, used trees. And what they have done was that they have came up with this airplane that acts also like a petrol station. So these fighter jets, they can refuel in the middle of the air. Okay, so over here, the line here. So there's actually a hose uh, that would actually flow the petrol into the fighter jets. And then uh, PNG, so this is a teeth whitener, and this was developed using trees as well. The idea of this uh, was developed using trees. And then in Japan, um, yeah, for 20, 20, 24 years now, it has been uh, used in Japan. And, and in the last five years, picking up in China. So China, all of the universities are, are teaching their students in trees now. And in Malaysia, what we hope is that we hope to teach you guys on trees in high school. So I believe if you take RBT, Rekha Bentuk and Chipta, RBT, it's actually offered in uh, when you are in Form 2 and Form 3, uh, well, but just a very short chapter, okay? But hopefully over time, we are able to, to introduce more tools uh, in the curriculum and that we have the advantage that from even a young age, younger age, not just university, but in uh, high school and primary school, you'll be exposed to this method. And uh, Huawei, Vivo, uh, the large companies well known, they are also using trees. And in Malaysia, okay, so in Malaysia, uh, there was this high school kid. Uh, he, he was being trained by his teacher to solve a, 
a problem at their hometown of Taiping. And so what he has observed is this problem. So he said that during a flood, motorists cannot see the road divider. If you see these uh, orange poles here, okay, because the water level will rise up and then the motorists could not see the divider of the road. So that becomes very dangerous. So what did he do? So what he did was that he redesigned this pole over here from being a fixed one piece pole into a floating pole. So whenever the water level increases, whenever the water level increases, the internal part will float up. Okay, so it will float up. Okay, so do you need any motors? Do you need any sensors, any electronic parts? No, you are just converting the harmful flood water into something beneficial, nothing useful. So over here, he went ar around the world uh, to, to exhibit his idea, his product, and he got a lot of, uh, uh, of prizes. Okay, so he's from MRSN Typing. So that's Ali. Okay, so very, very simple, elegant design, but it solves a critical problem. Okay, so hopefully that uh, through, through your schools as well, you will be able to solve your community problems. Okay, so now, uh, this are for those who are interested, uh, especially those teachers, uh, if you're interested to, to read more about the case studies, you can always email me. I'll, I'll leave my email at the end of this uh, sharing session and I can email you these books, okay? Now, so what is actually TREES? TREES is actually not a word, it's actually an acronym. And in English, it stands for Theory of Inventive Problem Solving, okay? So this is in Russian. TREES is in Russian. So that's why the background picture that's in Russia, right? And it's an acronym. So T R I Z. So if you caught, you were to to translate it into English, it's theory of inventive problem solving. So what does it mean with inventive problem? It means that these are problems where we need to invent a new solution. Okay, these are problems that have contradictions that have not been solved before, and we need a new solution. Okay. So it's a systematic way of solving problems. It's based on logic and data. And it does not depend on your emotions, on how you're feeling that day. It is a step-by-step -step approach. And how did we come up with this step-by-step -step approach? It's because it's through a study of patents, okay? So over here is the founder. and His name is Conrich Altschiller. And he was born in the 1920s. And he was an inventor from a very young age. Okay, about your age now. So he came up with a new diving apparatus where you do not need, where you do not need to carry your heavy and large scuba tank uh, when you go diving. So what he did was that he invented the snorkeling mask with a very long hose. So you can place your heavy snorkeling uh, tank on the boat, whereas you can just go uh, to dive in the water without needing to carry that. So that was the age of 15. And he wanted to invent more, okay? He wanted to invent more. But then, um, but he could not find any books or any articles or any trainers to, to help him to be a better inventor. So a lot of, oftentimes people say that either you're born a creative person or you're not, okay? So, but he wanted to challenge that. So anyway, one of his first job was to be in the Navy office and he was working in the patent department. Okay, so what is a patent? A patent is a certificate given to inventors for their invention so that they have the commercial rights over it so that they can sell it or they can lease it. It's up to them. Okay, so that they to show that they own that invention. Without a patent, anyone else could copy each other's uh, invention and that is not a good thing. All right, so a patent is then to certify that this inventor invented this product. Okay, so he discovered trees uh, in 1946. What is this? He, after studying 200,000 patents, he realized that only 40,000 are, are truly innovative. And out of this 40,000, he made three key discoveries. The first is this, that problems and solutions repeat itself in different industries. So although um, they are different industries, but they use the same solution. So that's interesting. Second is all products uh, will evolve according to a certain pattern. All right, all products will evolve according to a certain pattern. So one of it is that uh, things will become smaller and smaller. 
So let's look at our cars. It becomes smaller and smaller. Let's look at our handphone. It's becoming smaller and smaller. Let's look at our, our laptop and our PC. It's getting smaller and smaller. All right. Next, innovation lays in other scientific effects. It means that if we really want to be innovative, we need to hybrid and we need to use different science. For example, if I'm using a mechanical way to solve my problem, I need to use biology. I need to use chemistry. I need to use uh, other forms, electronic, to be more uh, innovative. Okay, so it's sort of like your durian as well. Uh, I believe durian season has just passed. You know, D24, it, it's actually a hybrid of a different species of durian. Okay, and, that, and that's how you get the best of both worlds, right? Um, now, but the key thing is this, somewhere over there on the rainbow, someone out there has already solved your problem or something similar to it. So you do not need to worry that there's actually a finite way of solving problems. So by analyzing all of these patents, Altula has come up with a step-by-step -step approach. It's like a cooking recipe. So he has reverse engineered and he has found out, oh, this is the thought process of all of the inventors. These are the thought process of all the inventors. So how nice would it be if we have the recipe to innovate? So we do have now, okay? So how does truth really work? It works as such. We always start with a specific problem, but there's a gap, okay? To reach a specific solution, there's a gap, okay? So we can get through the gap, through trial and error, and one day we will reach to the specific solution. But how nice would it be if we have a bridge and this is where trees comes in to be like a bridge. It helps us generalize the problem and to also propose general solutions. And from there, we can come up with a specific solution. Now, let me give you an example like this, okay? I believe you miss this very much, especially those who are taking your head maths. So usually we need to find the value of X, right? So we can find the value of X through trial and error. Okay, substitution method. Let's substitute x equals to 1, x equals to 2, x equals to 1.1, 1.2, and one day we would reach the answer, but after many, many painful calculations, all right? So that wastes a lot of time. But we, after going through from 4, from 5, we know that, hey, this is a quadratic equation. So we know that this is the general problem, a quadratic equation. So therefore, we have a formula. What is that solution? Is to use the quadratic equation. And from the quadratic equation, we can quickly generate a specific solution. So this is where trees x like that formula for innovation. Okay. So earlier on, Dr. Pixie was sharing about uh, innovation and creativity is by using your left brain or your right brain. So, but in, in, in innovation, we cannot just, over here, we see like, you know, a structured way and a very free way. So we need a balance of these two, actually. We need both. We believe in structured innovation, not just uh, free, you know, creative expression uh, without any boundaries. So we need it to be systematic as well, so that it's repeatable, okay? And so there are many, many discoveries in trees. So there are many tools, many different mind tools. So just like a toolbox, you have spanner, you have a hammer, you have a scissors, so on and so forth. Um, you have different, different tools for different problems. So all of these tools is actually to help us to overcome one thing, which is psychological inertia. And these are the usual uh, limitations that limit us from solving a problem. And psychological inertia is number one. Number two is lack of knowledge. Three is wrong objective. Four is promote compromise. Fifth is root cause is unknown. Okay, so let's look at psychological inertia first. What is that? It is the resistance of the mind to change its way of thinking. It is like a rock in our head that cannot be moved. Okay, someone tell you that, you know, try this apple. This apple is sweet. But you, from your past experience, you say that, no, it is sour. So you will not try another apple again. So there is a, based on our past experience, we have an inertia that we cannot change our way of thinking. And that's actually the major problem, okay? That prevents us from solving a, 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 an issue, okay? So we rely on our past experience. So that's the most critical. 
Number two, lack of knowledge. We are not an expert, but now we have Google. We collaborate with others who know how to solve the knowledge, so not too bad. Number three, wrong objective uh, is because we started off wrongly. We understand the problem wrongly, uh, like your karangan, okay, in your essay writing. If you read the question wrongly, then you go off tangent, totally wrong, okay. So oftentimes, in when we are listening to customers, also maybe we we understood the problem differently from our clients. Number four, uh, promotes compromise. Uh, oftentimes, we do not solve the problem entirely. We try to balance, uh, you know, to make both sides happy, and therefore we compromise, we optimize, and we do not resolve the conflict. So yeah, so that does not solve the problem. And number five is where uh, oftentimes we. When we see a small fire, we just, you know, uh, we just focus on, on solving that small fire, but we did not focus on uh, solving the cause of the fire. And that's the root cause. Okay. So, therefore, the fire will keep on recurring. Okay. So, but above all, uh, the hardest to solve is actually number one psychological inertia, the resistance to change our mindset. Okay. So, it's like a, this large rock again. And uh, so if you have a very large rock, you try to push, it's not moving because it has a very large inertia. Um, so similarly, it's like this. Uh, all of these scientists are blindfolded and they are to describe what's in front of them. So some say they are holding a spear. Some say they are holding a rope, a wall, a tree, so on and so forth. Yeah, all of them are right, but all of them are also wrong. They are right based on their limited observation, but you know, because they do not open up their mind, their psychological energy, they just focus on what they have in front of them. Yeah, they can get the picture totally wrong. Okay, so hopefully we won't be like that. Yeah. Now, so let's look at the 40 inventive principles. Okay. And um, now, when I mentioned earlier on that Alcho made one of the key discoveries, he said that solutions and problems repeat themselves. Yeah. So what he found out was that all of the patents could be synthesized if we were to boil them down, condense them, or rather synthesize them. Okay. And we would actually reach to a list of 40 principles. So in other words, these 40 principles represent all technical solutions that are out there. And 60, 70 years have passed, and we still cannot find the 41st principle. So in other words, that now we have like a formula sheet, a cheat sheet, okay? A cheat sheet. Um, if, for example, if you are given a choice, would you prefer a multiple choice question or would you prefer a subjective-based question? How many of you prefer which? I think majority would prefer MCQ, multiple choice question, because in Malaysia, we have one skill and it's called Timba. Okay, so even if we are not studied for, for that topic, uh, we can go through A, B, C, D. We have a 25% chance of getting it right. So, of course, in this case, we don't have just four options, A, B, C, D. We have 40. But still, this is better than uh, a very open-ended possibility of, you know, mixing and matching and getting or generating a solution. Um, so over here, these are the cheat sheet. These are the 40 inventive principles. Uh, and now, for the full definitions, you can always go just go build it up. And these days, we see these principles being used not just in inventing products, but also in processes and also in different different applications like marketing, like management and business. So we are seeing this being applied beyond the technical realm. Okay, so these are the, the, the popular tool of trees is the 14 value principle. And yeah, please Google it up if you have time. All right. Now, um, these are like the building blocks, like languages is made out of ABCs, uh, A to Zs, and your numbers 1 to 9 and 0. Um, so likewise, this is the, the building blocks in the language of creativity. And, um, now, and also it's similar to your periodic table. So for those who are taking chemistry, so these are all the known elements so far that we know in our Earth. So these are all the known elements, okay? So likewise, uh, these are all the known inventive principles that represent all innovation, okay? Now, so let's go 
through some case studies. Let's go through some case studies together. And let's see, okay, let's see how creative you are. Over here, we'll start off with this uh, social problem, okay? We start off with this social problem. And uh, so what we have here is an organ, and we have difficulty in getting enough organ donors, all right? So we have difficulty in getting organ donors. And let's say, um, let's say you are the uh, chief minister of Penang, all right? You're the chief minister of Penang and you have absolute power, you can do anything. What will you do? to increase the number of organ donors in Penang. What will you do to increase the number of organ donors in Penang? All right. So some of you uh, would say that, okay, let's have a campaign. Uh, let's have roadshow in schools, right? Or some of you might say, make it compulsory, no choice. As long as you are born in Penang, you must donate your organ. So some of you might be that as well. But you see, uh, if our problem, if our solution have a secondary problem, that means it's not a good solution. So, what is the secondary problem that arises with the first solution of having uh, 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 education drive? So, if we do education drive in every school, in every office, is it very fast or very slow? It's very slow. It takes a long time, and it takes a long effort as well. And then, if we want to reward those who 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 donate their organs so it is costly as well because we need to to come up with the rewards so that's costly uh, but if we make it compulsory and mandatory then maybe in the uh, maybe in the next election we will not be able to be the chief minister okay people will vote us out okay so people would not be happy because they are forced uh, so how can we solve the subsidiary problems as well okay now I'll give you a hint, and out of the 40 inventive principles, my most favorite is number 13, the other way around. So number 13, uh, the inventive principle of number 13 is, means do the opposite, do the opposite. So, yeah. so what is doing the opposite of signing up for to be an organ donor? Okay, so the key term here is the opposite of signing up. So instead of signing up, we need to sign out. Okay, so what has happened in, uh, let's say, Singapore and Malaysia? In Malaysia, for us to be an organ donor, we need to sign up, okay? We need to sign up to be an organ donor, whereas uh, in in uh, in Singapore, uh, automatically, the moment you are 21 years old, you will receive a letter from the government, and they will say that your name has been included, has been included in the uh, organ donation database, but they also give you a form and you fill up the form if you want to sign out, if you want to remove your name from that list, from that database, okay? So in Singapore, they have higher proportion, uh, higher ratio of organ donors, okay, compared to their population, uh, compared to Malaysia, okay? So in Germany, in Australia, similar case as well. In Germany, it's an opt-in option, uh, like Malaysia, and only about 14% of the population are organ donors, whereas for Austria, their neighboring country, it's over 90%, and it's an opt-out option, okay? So just do the opposite, and then we can solve a lot of problems. Um, let's look at the next challenge. Uh, over here, what do we have here? Do we have the International Space Station? So International Space Station, and uh, NASA is one of the many collaborators that have set up the International Space Station. Okay, now the International Space Station is powered up using solar panels. Okay, so over here we have solar panels. When they were setting this up, they realized that, oh yeah, got cracks, got cracks. Okay, and then they identified the root cause. How come got cracks? They found out that during, uh, in the, during manufacturing on Earth, the technician tend to drop their tools, their hammer, their spanner, so on and so forth. They tend to drop their tools on the solar panels and therefore got cracks, small cracks, but it becomes larger in space because in space, you've got fluctuation in temperature, very hot, very cold, and therefore the crack become larger and larger. On Earth, they could not detect it. So the root cause is that the technician keep dropping their tools. Oh, yeah, that's not a good thing. All right, that's not a good thing. So how can we solve this problem? All right, how can we solve this problem? Um, so this 
problem was faced by the actual NASA engineers. And what they did first was to was to punish. Okay, so HR, Human Resource Department, decided to identify hmm, which technician was involved, which engineer was involved uh, during that time, and they will punish them. Okay, uh, but did that help? No, it did not prevent the next problem. All right, it did not help. So then they internally, NASA uses trees as well. NASA uses trees. And then they had an internal trees workshop. This is one of the problems they tried to solve. And, and uh, they came up with a very, very simple solution. Okay, But before we go into that, uh, I believe that uh, some of you might be thinking, hmm, let us coat the solar panel with like a protective glass, like how we are protecting our our handphone screen okay or some of you might be thinking about hmm let's use rubber instead of metal tools so that you'll bounce off okay or some of you might be thinking let's uh, attach a string by the end of the tool to our wrist so that it will not fall off okay or some of you might even think let's use robotic arms let's remove the engineers altogether let's use robotic arms let's use robots okay uh, so these are the common answers that uh, we we get from students and also seasoned engineers. Okay, so even experienced engineers. These are the common solutions. But the secondary problem that arises from that is cost. Okay, so to get a new robot to do R and D, uh, train up the robot that requires a lot of material. Okay, so oftentimes innovation. What makes innovation so difficult is cost. If it's very costly, your boss, your organization, your company will not likely to approve it. Okay, so that is the challenge, but it's an interesting challenge. So now, let me give you a hint. Let's try to apply this principle again, the other way around. And let's see whether we can solve this problem the other way around. So now, um, so imagine this, that currently uh, on Earth, so, on Earth, this is like a large table, okay? This is the table legs, okay? So on Earth now, currently the panels are placed on this large table and they are working on this. So what is the other way around? The other way around means is to suspend it. So now they invert it and now this will be attached to the ceiling, okay? So now we have the ceiling, and then we have the legs, and we have the tabletop, and uh, we have the solar panels here. Okay, so it's like in the your car workshop, they just flip it the other way around, and then even if they drop their tools, even if they drop their tools, it will be away from the solar panel. So problem solved. So that was a simple solution that arrived using this principle over here. And uh, yeah, do they need to invest in new tools or new robots? No, they don't need to. The problem could be solved straight away in the same day. Okay, so when we talk about innovation, it's not about you know coming up with the with you know the fancy robots all the time, you know, or fancy software and fancy AI. No, oftentimes it's about elegant and simple solutions, and that's actually harder to achieve. Okay, now. All right. Okay. Next challenge. Okay. So what we have here is uh, chocolate fillers. Okay. Um, so in this fancy chocolate over here, uh, we have syrup inside. Okay. So we would have syrup inside. And how do they actually put the syrup or pour the syrup into the chocolate? They would actually have uh, two halves of the chocolate. So over here... This is one half of the chocolate, okay? So if it's hollow, and then what they do is they pour over the syrup. They pour the syrup inside. So, but this process takes very long time, okay? It takes very long time because syrup flows very slowly. Like your honey, it flows very slowly. So what they tried to do was they tried to heat it up. So they tried to heat it up. And then the syrup can go flow faster. But when the syrup is heated up and the syrup is hot, what will happen to the chocolate shell? It will melt. So that is the secondary problem. A warmer syrup flows faster, 
but then it melts the chocolate. So how do we solve this problem? And I'll give you another clue. And yeah, it's the same principle again, the other way around. Okay, the other way around. So instead of heating up, what must we do? Instead of heating up, must, what must we do? Cool it down? We have to go more extreme. We need to chill it. We need to freeze it. Okay. So what we do is we freeze up the syrup and uh, we would have syrup balls. And then instead of using uh, this uh, solid chocolate shells, we have a chocolate fountain. So what we do is we dip. So we have the syrup ball. So, and we have like a fountain. All right. So we have like a pool of chocolate. Okay. So we just dip it into here. All right. So we just dip it into here. It will be coated with that chocolate. All right. So problem solved. Okay. So it will be faster that way. Okay. Now let's see at another challenge. Okay. Let's look at another challenge. Uh, I like to give you a different variety of problems. Okay. Because in out there in the working world, you'll be facing different variety of problems. Uh, let's backtrack a little bit. So over here, we have a social problem. We have a process problem, a signing up uh, process problem. Over here, we really have a technical issue, a technical problem. Um, and then over here, we have a manufacturing issue. Yeah, not of a high tech product, but of a very simple product. Okay, chocolate. And then over here, uh, we have a, a problem of human resource. Okay, so over here in the farms, The problem here is that the strawberries were they ripe very fast and they go bad very fast so we need to harvest it fast but then we do not have enough manpower so not enough manpower so yeah because especially overseas labor is expensive so labor is expensive so therefore Oftentimes, the farmers will then decide that, okay, I think it's not cost effective. It's not cost effective to even hire people to harvest it. It is better to, 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 it is better to just uh, let it rot, okay? It is better to let it rot. So, yeah. Now, so what would you do to help me solve these problems? So instead of... So instead of so instead of um, instead of instead of uh, hiring more people, um, so some might say let's hire foreign labor. So they may be uh, at, at a cheaper cost, but then that does not solve the problem as well because it's hard to get uh, to hire uh, labor. Okay. okay, just apologize for some noise, uh, my colleagues. Yeah, they're just having a louder discussion. <laughs> okay, okay, now so. What will you do to help me solve this problem? I need people to harvest the strawberries in time, but I do not want to spend money to hire people. You see the challenge there? Okay, I need to hire people, but I don't want to spend money to hire people. Now, I'll give you a hint again, and no prizes for guessing what principle it is, but it is principle number 13, all right? So this principle again, the other way around. So what will you do? So you cannot hire workers you cannot hire workers so what will you do you cannot hire workers so instead of hiring workers you hire your customers to plug it for you does that make sense now so in 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 australia uh, there's actually some farms that have strawberry buffet so what they do is that the customers will drive to the farm and they will be given for example one hour okay to eat as much strawberry to pluck as much strawberry as they can and to eat it in the farm so it's a strawberry buffet but the key challenge is that they cannot take cannot tap out back cannot bring home okay so they cannot bring home and uh, they have to eat it on the spot okay so that's so that's the challenge and and and, and yeah so so it has worked fantastically and uh, because uh, people would actually treat it as a family activity they'll be driving all the way and it's quite far from the city by the way it's more than an hour's drive but people are willing to go for it 
And the farmers, they save on transportation costs, they save on labor costs, and they do not waste the strawberries, okay? Uh, because without the customers coming, it will just override and it will just be wasted. Okay, so the other way around. Instead of hiring workers, they hire the customers. Okay, principle 13. So, so now we see that the principle can be used for product design, for manufacturing processes, uh, for social problems, and also for business models in the case of the strawberry. And that's why we see that more and more uh, different ways of applying the principles will come about. Okay. So, but yeah, so at least the main key takeaway that I'd like to share with you all today is to have this principle, the other way around. Just by doing the opposite, uh, you can already be creative. Why don't consider, uh, do the opposite side, go the opposite direction, use the opposite side of the thing, um, go do, use the opposite flow of the process, you know, just do the opposite, yeah, and, and then and see whether that makes sense or not, okay? Now, how do we know whether that solution is the best solution? Is we just simply consider this, the function of that solution, whether it has solved the problem, and, and what cost? Is it more costly? Do we need to invest more money in building up, redesigning the tool? Does it cause any side harm to the user, to the environment? Okay, so this is how we measure. So ideal final result is achieved when the solution delivers a function without any cost without causing any harmful side effects with zero cost and zero harm. Now, an example of an ideal product is like uh, the projector screen. So what we have in front from the pictures that I see, you have a projector screen. But how can we remove the projector screen but at the same time still be able to project the image? So imagine if it, behind the projector screen is a white wall. So if we have a white wall behind, uh, we do not need a projector screen. The white wall becomes that projector screen. So do we have any cost? No, no cost. The, the wall is already there. Do we cause any harm? No, no harm as well. Uh, yeah. So the, yeah, these are examples. And oftentimes it's like impossible to reach zero cost and zero harm, but we set that as the target. Why? It's so that we will force ourselves to think of radical new solutions. If we just put a target of saying, okay, I want to reduce cost by 10%, so we will always rely on the same solution. We won't think out the box. We won't challenge ourselves. So we come up with a statement of saying that, okay, let's achieve zero cost and zero harm. And that forces ourselves to think of radical solution. So whatever that you develop, always use this to, to gauge and to measure whether your problem or your solution, is it, uh, is it, is it ideal or not? Okay, that's how we measure it. Okay, now, understanding our personalities. So we, we've covered about trees, about tools, and uh, the main, uh, the main uh, principle that I share with you all is do the other way around, do the opposite, 13, all right? So these are tools, and under trees, there are many, many more different tools. There are dozens of different tools, okay? So this inventive principle is one tool, and there are many, many more tools, okay? So there are many more things to discover about trees. Um, but besides that, I, and this is something bonus that I add on. Usually in my other sharings, I don't share, but with y'all, because you are still in high school, I think this is very, very important that you need to understand yourself very well first, okay? Especially those who are still picking, uh, deciding uh, what career or what which university course to take or what to do to even start working now, so which career path to, to take. So you need to understand your personality first. So this is something extra that I've prepared for you guys. And this, there are many personality tests out there, but the MBTI or the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator is a very, very good one. So over here, it says that uh, Myers-Briggs is actually a mother dot and daughter team. So they're uh, psychologists uh, back in the 1940s, 50s. And so they came up with this, uh, with this research to identify that all of us, human beings could be categorized into 16 different personality types. 16, one six, okay? And one six. So to understand ourselves a little bit better, all of us fall within this, either one of these 16 personalities. So to identify which type of personality we are, uh, there's a free test, and this is the website. You can just Google up um, 16personalities.com Okay, you can just Google it up and then there'll be like a 10 minute test 
and then after the test you will identify yourself you know which one are you so there's 16 over here and uh, i find this very useful and i did this i did this maybe about five six years ago and how i wish i actually had done this test um, during my high school years. I really wish that I have done this. And maybe I would have picked a different course to study, perhaps. I would have a different direction, perhaps. Because from here, you will understand your strengths and your areas of improvements. And also, what are your main passion? So I find this pretty accurate. Uh, yeah, so, so do feel free to take up the free test. I encourage all teachers as well to encourage your students to take this up because they will also have a recommendation on what career path best suits their personality. Okay. Now, that being said, um, our personality do change every six months, depending on our environment. So if we are in a new environment for six months consecutively, it might change our personality. All right. So it might change, but uh, slight changes won't be too drastic depending on the scenario. So if in the environment that we're in is extremely different, extremely difficult, we might have a different personality, okay? But generally, it would not be too different. And anyway, I would just recommend you to take this test. Uh, so yeah, so now, uh, for those who have time, uh, I believe uh, most of you have the computers in front of you, so you can do this later on. But now I'll just wrap up a little bit, and then you can do this test, okay? Um, so I'll just wrap up with this, and this is by Grace Hopper, Admiral Grace Hopper, and she said this, a ship in the port or at the ferry is safe, but this is not what ships are built for. Okay, you are not meant to be at the ferry. Go out and sail. Sail to the sea and try new things. What are the new things to try? The things that you like, all right? The things that you like so that that is what i hope that all of you would keep on trying there is no limit even uh, there's no limit in, you know and especially in the now women in science speak do not think that uh, you're inferior in fact you are superior and in our team uh, and, and my team in my company here uh, we hire mainly female programmers yeah so because of the strengths uh, for you girls you are more analytical you are more patient and you're more hardworking. So these are the characteristics that we we truly admire. And therefore, most of our hiring of our programmers are girls. We are hiring a lot of girl programmers. Okay. So anyway, now, so I'm doing the other way around. Instead, you know, all the time people is asking you for answers. But here, I'm asking you for questions. Okay. So, uh, for every of the schools out there, uh, perhaps teachers can post the question on behalf or even if the, the teachers could participate. Uh, for, for every question, you would get a book. Okay, so we have 20 books. So the first 20 questions will get a book and we'll post it to your school. Okay, so for every school uh, halls out there in every session, so do for the teachers, we need your help to do take note of the student. Uh, which student is the one that asked the question and then later on we'll just ship the book over to your school and then you, you could help us distribute to the winner okay so we got 20 books uh, that my trees has uh, sponsored for this and this book is retailing at 100 ringgit <laughs> and uh, it's actually priceless uh, because over here is written by anatoly green so anatoly green is one of the trees masters in the world that specializes in teaching trees for children okay in in helping children to achieve their potential or being a problem solver so over here in this book here it deals with 150 open problems so these are open problems of everyday things so what are open problems open problems are the opposite of closed problems closed problems are problems where you have an absolute solution for you have a known solution for example one plus one is always two so those are known problems but open problems are like a plus b what is it it could be c it could be d it could be e so those are problems with unknown solutions or with many potential solutions so in this book over here is a very good read to enhance your iq uh, to prepare you even for potentially uh, interview questions okay so yeah so this is a very good book especially those in high school i believe all of those joining us today are from high school but if you're from primary school do let us know we have another book 
uh, that is uh, called Smart Tales. And in the, that book, especially written for primary school children, uh, we have problems related to dragons, to knights, to princesses. Yeah, so we have different stories and the children will need to, to help the hero to win uh, and to kill the monsters. Okay, so um, so th those books are different. Uh, do let us know if you're from primary school, we'll ship you them. But for, I believe that most of us are in high school. So this book, every page is colored, fully colored. And yeah, so I'll, I'll need um, Sean's help. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sean's help. And to see, are there any questions? So far, there are no questions, but uh, okay. for those who are still uh, with us, uh, please do yeah. ask your questions. Uh, yeah. You can get to you. I, I think that some of them are joining via the school halls, you know, in the yeah. club yeah. group setting. So yeah. uh, get over to your desktop or laptop there. Uh, type the question in to us, uh, and the first twenty, right, uh, Doctor Isaac? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first twenty will ship over the books. Yeah, yeah. O only for a live session, okay? So this thing it's going Correct. to happen for the live session. So uh, you right. have time. Let's let's uh, ask your question. You can choose Facebook. You can choose YouTube. Uh, when this live session is happening. Uh, yeah. You can just ask the questions. You'll we'll pull them up, and then you'll win yourself that book. Yes. Okay. So the other way around. Uh, so normally you have to answer, answer, and you get prizes. You, you ask question, you get prize. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so okay. Um, yeah. So I think perhaps also they're figuring out the mechanisms on you know mm -hmm. uh, on on how to go about it. Uh, but yeah. So we we'll just wait for a while. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. I have, uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Isaac, for that very yeah. perspective uh, talk. Um, we also have a, a survey, so um, we, can, we can also do this survey uh, oh, okay. for, for, yeah, for the students. You need to do this survey to be invited to get your certificate. So please don't forget to do this survey. Uh, so you can either scan the code, or we will also uh, click the. Uh, you can also click the link in the chat box in the comment section. We will also post uh, the link over there. So please do uh, fill up to be entitled for your description. Okay, and if you have any questions for the class, any question at all, uh, I believe. If any question at all, it doesn't have to be. Uh, yeah. So just any question and then you get the book. Yeah, so perhaps they're still figuring out the mechanisms as well. Uh, yeah, but anyway, if there are no takers, so uh, how many how many schools are involved here, Sean? In this session? Uh, quite a bit, quite a bit of schools. Uh, uh, a lot of students actually are participating uh, in your session because we are streaming live on YouTube. And also we have uh, students out of Penang, all over which are joining as well through the Mingo Science Negara uh, platform. Okay, that's great. That's great. Great to know. Okay, so because uh, from what I see so far, the list uh, they were like SMK Georgetown, Simpang Empat, Berapit, and Secret Hunt. So uh, these are just a few of the many other schools, is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, thank okay. you. Those are the schools yeah. that are registered directly to us, uh, okay. and we have also those that are uh, from all over Malaysia. I see. Okay, so okay, I'll maybe I'll kickstart uh, the ball rolling. So uh, I'll just share with you the frequently asked questions. So usually students sometimes will ask, uh, where do we learn about trees? Okay, so you can actually self learn. That's how I started as well before. The My Trees Association, Association started. I did a lot of self reading, but I found out that a lot of books out there are in Russian. And this is like more than 10 years ago. So, but now, of course, there's more books in English. You could self learn, that's one. Another way is that uh, you can go onto our website, uh, as stated here, mytrees.com.my, and then uh, we have our calendar of our trainings and so on and so forth. But for teachers and schools who are interested, uh, we can also do some CSR programs with you all. 
don't worry, just write on to us. Uh, we have my email over here, mytreesmalaysia.gmail.com. We are more than willing to, to support your efforts. So yeah, okay. For those teachers who are into innovation, into getting your students to come up with new inventions. Yeah. Um, and then what kind of training we provide? We have practitioner training. So we have three levels offered in Malaysia. Uh, internationally, there are actually five levels. Uh, in Malaysia, we offer up to level three. And uh, usually level one is also good enough for you to kickstart to be an inventor. Okay. Uh, another thing is that uh, do we use this in our workplace? Yes, I would say, because we're talking about skills. Uh, we're not talking about knowledge. Knowledge, we have Mr. Google. So any information, we can always Google up. And uh, it's not about memorizing knowledge anymore. Last time, those with knowledge, they hold the key. All right. But then now with uh, with the internet, we have democrat democratization of knowledge. Okay. Oh, yes, Sean. Yeah, yeah, that was, I think, yeah. Uh, I always also tell uh, my interns to join us. Okay. And I also find, I also hire those that are, you know, borderline 2.0. Uh, as long as they have the right attitude uh, and Correct. they can actually, they have right mindset, they can actually learn a lot of things because so many things available on the internet now, like we say, democratization of the knowledge and information. Correct, correct, correct. And, and this is what the Intel, uh, the Intel team has shared with, with me back then was that they realized they hired those who are first class honors, those fresh graduates are first class honors, and they realize that although they are top in their class, but they still need to retrain them in problem solving because they are very good in textbook problems, but not in real world problems. And so that is why their passion is to share trees. Um, yeah, so because it's all about skills. And, and as you say, character also is another important trait. Yeah, just to will to. And, and I think oftentimes there's a struggle with students to perform well because it's not on the area that they are, they have the, the the passion for or the strength for. And I would uh, propose that all students, if you have access to the computers now, uh, if you don't have it now, later on, I would really recommend you to do the MBTI, the 16 personalities test. And uh, I wish I, I have this, I would have discovered this way earlier. That would have uh, given me understanding on what I really enjoy. So yeah, so if, if you are really passionate about what you are doing, uh, you would actually be hardworking on it. So uh, what I see is that oftentimes people are in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. So so that's that. Uh, but anyway, um, Sean, do you have the full list of all the? Do you have the full list of all the schools that are participating? I do not have them with me. Uh, okay. Oh. Uh, my colleague, and then get back to you on the. Okay. Sure. 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 So so we wish to distribute the the books to the as many schools as we can. And if none are in the Q&A, maybe they're having some mechanism issues on getting the questions uploaded. But anyway, uh, we'll try to, to post it to all the schools. Uh, yeah, so that's what we'll try to do. But you all have the contact persons of each school as well, right? Yes, that's and, right. Yeah, that's awesome. And what we hope is that then maybe we can put this up in the library, in the schools, then all yeah. the students can share. Yeah. Yes, that's a brilliant idea. That's a brilliant idea. Yeah. So then, uh, yeah, so, so, so yeah, they can benefit on this. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, and also, yeah, uh, great effort by Penang Tech Dome in, in having this effort and programs. I wish during my time also got one. Yeah. My time going with the internet. <laughs> Thank you very much for always supporting yeah. us year after year. No, no, but and, and apologies that I can't increase the level of engagement uh, due to this limitation here. But it would be great to be there in Penang next year to engage with the students face to face. Yeah. All right. So, uh, uh, yeah, no, no comments. I've even asked. Uh, no. no worries. If you have any questions, yeah, I, I think uh, sending them to the sending the books to them will really help. Uh, okay. and will help the whole school and also the yeah. future students as well. Okay. 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 So we'll just need to, after this, uh, we'll take it offline and then we'll just need the list of uh, uh, the, the schools, their addresses and the person, the contact person to address it to. Yeah. And then we'll take it from there. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you awesome. So much. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so there you have it. Uh, thank you for joining us since 9 a.m. this morning, uh, going through the opening ceremony, the speeches, uh, talks by the four distinguished uh, women scientists, and also those who are uh, now with our workshops, seven parallel workshops happening at the same time, and uh, we're at the end of our three uh, workshop. Okay, so uh, we hope to see you all uh, for other events and also next year's uh, installment of Women in Science. Take care. or half of the banana into the zipper bag. Remove the air. Seal the bag and then mash the banana using your hand. Next, open the zipper bag. Add the solution into the zipper bag. Seal and mix them well. Put the strainer on top of the cup to filter the mixture. Use the spoon to let the mixture to come down. Pour the remaining solution Pour all of the alcohol into the mixture. Now you get the DNA. You can keep the extracted DNA inside a plastic cup. So what is DNA? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and it can be found in every living organism that you can eat. DNA can be found or located inside our tiny cell, which means it is smaller than the cell, and that is why we cannot observe the DNA by our naked eyes. Um, the function of DNA is to carry genetic information about us, that our physical characteristic of having uh, straight hair or curly hair, that is all the information carried by the DNA. And uh, different people will have different DNA, which means my DNA and your DNA are different, unless we are a twin. The twins have more similarities in their DNA and that is why they look identical or almost identical. So what happened in this process is, when soap added to the solution, it will help to break down the cell. The cell membrane is made of lipids. The same concept as oil, when oil mixed with soap, it will dissolve inside the soap. Adding salt and alcohol to the solution helps the DNA strand to stick together in the trunk and make it more visible to our naked eyes. At the same time, adding alcohol will also help to wash all the impurities in the DNA. Scientists use DNA extraction methods to extract or bring out the DNA from living organism cells in order to study the DNA further. I hope you have learned something from this episode. Like and share this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon. See you next time. Bye-bye.